So hey guys. This is your favorite fanfic universe so in this video. We will see. What if Naruto was the legend of Dragon Sage. But before we start. Be sure to subscribe and like this video because we the give the quality content videos. Now let's start. Naruto was fuming. He had spent the better part of his day walking through the streets of Konoha ranting out loud. Not only did Kakashi sensei blow me off to go train the Teme, but my replacement sensei is a joke. He sighed in frustration. Guess I'll have to train on my own then. It was then that he heard the sound of giggling not too far off, so he decided to investigate. Naruto walked closer to the origin of the sound and the sight before him made him sweat drop. Before his very eyes stood a grown man with long spiky white hair crouched down, staring intently through a peephole into the women's hot springs and giggling like a pervert. Naruto stared for a moment before deciding to let the prankster side of him take over. He took a deep breath and shouted, Hey! Why are you peeping into the women's hot spring old man? At the mention of a pervert the women in the hot spring shot a death glare at the newly discovered peephole. Upon seeing this, Jiraiya promptly fell on his ass. He stared up at Naruto with fear in his eyes. How could you do this to me? He shouted hysterically. Naruto began to smirk, calm down, all I did was ruin your little show. No. Jiraiya began. You don't understand. Jiraiya froze as he felt eyes peer into his very soul. He turned slowly to face a group of half-naked women clothed only in towels. He laughed nervously and said, Hey ladies. The women, seeing that Jiraiya was still crouched near the peephole, deduced that he must be the pervert. So one of them taking the lead yelled, Show him what happens to perverts girls. The color in Jiraiya's face vanished like the avatar. Eh, and get it. No? I'll stop. As the group of women descended upon him. Fortunately one of the girls in the front of the group tripped falling on Jiraiya and pushing her fleshy mounds into his face. Realizing the compromising position she was in the woman shot up onto her feet with a blush and ran away grumbling about touchy perverts. Looking at Jiraiya, one could see that his face was one of pure bliss. The group of women, undeterred, descended UOPN the old sage and began to beat the life out of him. During this whole spectacle Naruto was off to the side snickering. Once their rage subsided and they were satisfied with the now bloody man, the ladies went back about their business. As Naruto was about to turn around and find Sam where to train Jiraiya shot up from the ground seemingly unfazed by his previous beating. He looked to Naruto, grabbed him by the shoulders and said, I think I'm in love. That woman's body was so voluptuous and her boobs were so soft and. Naruto spoke. What are you even talking about? And who are you? Who am I? I am Jiraiya. The one and only toad sage of Mount Myoboku. Jiraiya exclaimed as he struck a pose. And for your involvement in getting me so close to such a beautiful woman I will grant you one request. Anything? Naruto asked. Anything? Jiraiya repeated. Naruto thought for a moment before saying, well, I still need a sensei to teach me about ninja stuff. Consider it done. And I know just the jutsu to teach you. Before Naruto could say anything the old sage placed his hand on Naruto's shoulder and shunshined away. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Suddenly Naruto found himself beside a stream with Jiraiya not too far away. Okay kid let's start your training, Jiraiya declared. Naruto glared at the man. Hey you can't just whisk people away like that you old perv, he exclaimed. Jiraiya deadpanned. Do you want to learn this super cool jutsu or not? Naruto frowned but kept quiet to listen. Okay, Jiraiya started. Here's what you gotta do. First you need to draw blood, Jiraiya bit his thumb and continue with the lesson. Then you need five hand seals, boar, dog, bird, monkey, then ram in that order. And finally, summoning jutsu, Jiraiya slammed his palm on the ground and in a poof of smoke a giant toad appeared. Naruto's jaw hit the floor. That's amazing. I've never seen anything like that before. Jiraiya closed his eyes to bask in the praise his new student was giving him. Jiraiya missed the look of determination that flashed across Naruto's face, and by the time he opened his eyes it was too late. He saw Naruto with a bloody thumb going through the hand seals of the summoning jutsu. Wait Naruto. You can't, summoning jutsu. Naruto rammed his palm into the ground and in the classic poof of smoke, he vanished. Jiraiya stared dumbfounded at the space that Naruto had just occupied. This is why I can't have an apprentice. 
They always do dumb shit and get themselves killed. Jiraiya exclaimed with anime tears running down his face. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
he could feel every skin cell burn with the intensity of the sun and become ash, but he held strong and endured. Halfway through the test the stream of fire intensified and the flames turned blue. The fire is getting hotter, Naruto thought. A a a a a a a g h h h. Naruto screamed in agony but he refused to back down and after a little while the test was over. He dropped to his knees and stared at the new mark. Now's my test. All you have to do is solve a riddle. Jakuna spoke. Naruto still had an eye closed from the pain and his mind was slightly foggy. They must have done that on purpose, to make the riddle harder to solve. A man is condemned to death and has to choose between three rooms, one room has raging fires in it, another has deadly trained shinobi, and the last has three lions who haven't eaten in years. Which room is safest? Delirious from the pain Naruto furrowed his brow in deep thought. The shinobi are way too dangerous so it's fire or lions. Naruto had never seen a lion but he had read and heard stories of their strength and ferocity. A person could probably live through a fire. Resigned to his conclusion he opened his mouth to answer the riddle but just then his stomach growled. Naruto flinched, ugh this hunger is gonna kill me, wait a fucking minute. He looked up to Jakuna with a fire in his eyes and said, the answer is room number three. Why? Because the lions haven't eaten for years which means they've already starved to death. Jakuna smirked and spit a fireball at Naruto's wrist to place his mark. The three dragons combined their strems of fire to make the summoning scroll appear. Signing the contract will allow you to summon the rest of the clan, Chishiki said. Do you have like a pen or something? Naruto asked. You're supposed to use your blood you idiot. Chikara spoke. Naruto rubbed the back of his head in embarrassment and bit his thumb to sign the contract. Now that you've signed our contract you must know that as you are, you cannot summon us whenever you'd like, Chishiki said. What do you mean? We will only come to your aid if you are in mortal danger or there is a chance you will take severe damage, Chishiki stated. Why? Is there a way I can overcome this? The only way for you to change this is if you gain the title of Dragon Sage. To do this you must get past the second most powerful dragon and meet our boss summon, Jakuna said. His name is Mundana and he lives in the cave over there, get past him to get to our boss and he will grant you the title of Dragon Sage, Chikara stated. Naruto looked over to the cave in the mountainside and readied himself for a fight. Naruto approached the cave entrance, it was dark and damp. He could see sharp stalagmites drooping down, threatening to pierce him if they came loose. He inched further into the cave, the safety of the sunlight fading behind him. As he ventured deeper into the chilling darkness his foot hit something. He glacked down to see what he had tripped on, but he couldn't make out exactly what it was, there wasn't enough light. He bent down to pick up and examine this object. He turned around to face the direction the sunlight was gleaming through the cave entrance. It was then that he finally knew what he was holding. He dropped it in shock and began to back away but he tripped and fell backwards. He glanced around him and saw that the cave floor was littered with skulls and bones, human and animal alike. A shiver went down his spine, his fear spiked to untold levels and he got the feeling he was being watched. He stood up and immediately heard the sound of crunching bones behind him. Naruto whipped around and drew a kanai to defend himself. He finally came face to face with Mundana. He wasn't nearly the size of the other three dragons Naruto had met but he was every bit as intimidating. With a slim and sleek figure and scales black as night Mundana stared at Naruto teeth bared for the world to see. Naruto could tell that this dragon was built for speed and in Naruto's mind speed was power. One would only need to look at his hero the fourth Hokage to prove that fact. Have you come to challenge me boy? Mundana's voice reverberated throughout the cave. Naruto was shaking slightly, but he spoke anyway. I have to beat you. You? Beat me? If you wish to add to my home decor Mundana glances to the pile of bones beside him. Be my guest. You're too weak to be more than a human shield, and even then you're too much a squirt to protect anything. Naruto gripped his kanai tightly in anger. Who was this dragon to insult him? He had no idea what Naruto had been through. He had no idea how hard Naruto trained to get to where he is. Feeling angry little one. Perhaps it's because you know I speak the truth. I'd wager you're the type that talks a big game but freezes when death comes knocking. You're weak. An image of the demon brothers flashed through his mind and he grew increasingly irritated. Naruto is known to be many things and being brash and impulsive are definitely some of those things. 
Naruto, in a flurry of rage sent his kanai sailing towards Mundana. Seeing this, the dragon smirked and simply batted the small knife away with its wing. In a burst of speed Mundana sent a barrage of bones flying up from the ground and towards Naruto, like a million pieces of organic shrapnel. Naruto raised his arms in an X to block some of these deadly projectiles. When the volley was over he could feel the pieces of bone that were embedded into his flesh. Naruto looked to Mundana. Only the dragon was no longer there, behind the cover of the barrage he had quickly moved to a new position. The question was, where? Naruto quickly created two clones and formed a small triangle standing back to back. Each Naruto drew a kanai as their eyes wandered searching for their foe. Suddenly a poof of smoke could be heard, looking to his right Naruto could see that his clone had been vanquished. Without warning a second poof was heard and before Naruto could process what happened he felt a sharp pain in his back as he was launched forward. Landing face first into a pile of bones, Naruto could feel three huge claw marks on his back. He rose up to look around but again, the dragon was nowhere to be seen. Kami this thing is fast. At this rate I'll never beat him. At this thought a light bulb appeared over Naruto's head, which immediately flickered out but, whatever. Hey Mundana. Are you so scared of me that you'll only fight me from the shadows? Show yourself. Chuckling could be heard echoing throughout the cave. Mundana began moving towards Naruto, emerging from the darkness. Most people would think it unwise to antagonize me. Naruto smirked. Yeah well, I'm not most people. Naruto launched his kanai towards Mundana, aimed for his head. Mundana lifted his wing and blocked the incoming projectile but in the process blocked Naruto from view. The dragon continued his slow trek towards Naruto. That trick didn't work the first time. What makes you think it would work now? Naruto shrugged and said, I planned a few steps ahead this time. Naruto quickly kicked up the pile of bones he was standing on sending them flying the same way Mundana had done in the beginning of the fight. For the third time Mundana began to raise his wing in order to block the incoming shrapnel, but suddenly three of the bones transformed into Naruto's. Seeing this, his eyes widened but there was no time to react as one of the clones grabbed a hold of his wing, setting him off balance. The second clone grabbed his other wing, and the third clone grappled his neck knocking him onto his back and pinning him to the ground. Quickly the third clone pulled something out of his pouch and held out for the dragon to see. Flash bomb. Mundana struggled to get free but it was too late. The cave was enveloped in a white blinding light that expanded outwards with Mundana at its epicenter. As the light fatted away Naruto lifted his hands off his eyes and he could see Mundana lightly pawing and rubbing at his eyes, trying to regain his sight. Naruto ran off into the depths of the cave, as he passed Mundana he laughed and yelled, take that yaw stupid lizard. Eventually while delving deeper into the caves he began to see light, he continued to run towards it until the cave expanded into one extremely large room. Naruto skidded to a stop. This must be where the boss is, he thought aloud. As Naruto glanced around he noticed streams of lava flowing in every direction, illuminating the cavern just enough for him to see. Wandering through the cavern he began to wonder where the boss summon was. He stumbled upon a river of lava, the lava seemed to flow much faster in this river than the other smaller streams so he decided to follow it. Eventually he discovered a lake of lava and in it lied a dragon so massive that it was comparable in size to the biju. It seemed as if the dragon could sense Naruto's presence as he opened his eyes to stare Naruto down. Naruto became entranced with the beauty of the dragon's eye. There were no pupils but in their place was a continuous swirling image of black with specks of red, white, and blue. It was as if when Naruto looked into the eyes of this dragon he could see the creation and subsequent infinite expansion of the cosmos. It was then that Naruto was broken out of his trance. The dragon had spoken. No mortal has made it to my chambers before, what is your name? Naruto gulped, just the mere presence of this being made him doubt himself. Was he worthy to speak while in the company of such a powerful dragon? Naruto could feel the raw power that rolled off this beast in waves, like those guys that put on three bottles of super strong cologne before going somewhere. It was suffocating. Nevertheless Naruto steeled himself and spoke, my name is Naruto Uzumak. I'm here to become a dragon sage. Naruto Uzumaki. This is a name I will remember. I am Akai Shi, King of the Dragons. Naruto chuckled slightly, the Red Death. A fitting name for a beast so powerful, he thought. Naruto was about to speak when he heard footsteps behind him. 
he looked back to see Mundana walking towards him. His presence put Naruto on edge but it didn't seem like Mundana was there to harm him. The dragon seemed much more relaxed and didn't have that aura of intimidation he had when they fought. Ah Mundana there you were. Where were you? You haven't forgotten the rules have you? Of course not my king but this one is rather cunning, Mundana said while glancing at Naruto. Naruto looked between the two dragons and questions began to surface. Wait. What rules are you talking about? Akai Shi faced Naruto and spoke, you've come to become a dragon sage, and there are rules in place that help you to progress through the trials given to you. Now Mundana spoke, for example, when we fought I was not allowed to use my abilities in order to give you a chance to succeed. I was also supposed to escort you into these royal chambers. Akai Shi's gaze on Mundana intensified, and why exactly, did you not escort him here? The smaller dragon shrunk into himself and his gaze met the ground. The boy had realized that it was impossible to defeat me so he blinded me with a flash bomb, and by the time I regained my sight he was already gone. Akai Shi seemed to be pondering over something, so he was able to determine the difference in strength between them and still come up with a plan to reach me. Not to mention that he passed the three brothers' tests as well. Perhaps there is more to this boy than meets the eye, he thought. Ater a moment of thinking Akai Shi spoke the words Naruto had been waiting for. Very well then, I hereby declare you the sole summoner of the dragons and the very first dragon sage. Naruto jumped for joy and in a huge grin, showed off his pearly whites. His face fell however when he saw that Akai Shi rose out of the lava and began to take a deep breath. Pure white flames spewed from Akai Shi's mouth and enveloped Naruto's upper body. Immediately his classic orange and blue jumpsuit was burnt to cinders. Surprisingly Naruto wasn't dead. He felt a burning sensation on the left side of his chest but other than that he was fine. Once the gout of flames stopped Naruto looked down to see that he had been branded with the mark of the dragon sage. The symbol was that of a sleeping dragon, waiting to be disturbed in order to wreak havoc upon his enemies. Akai Shi spoke once more, the full power of the dragons lies in your hands, use it wisely. With that, Naruto was poofed back into his own world. He appeared right where he originally disappeared. Turning his head slightly he could see Jiraiya pacing back and forth in worry. Naruto chuckled. What's wrong ya old perv? You worried about me. Jiraiya's head shot in the direction of Naruto's voice. Jiraiya straight up tackled Naruto to the ground and said, Oh thank goodness you came back. I don't how I would have told the Hokage that one of his citizens was missing because of me if you didn't. Naruto deadpanned, I am great, thanks for asking. Jiraiya looked at him and said, oh right, what the hell happened to you, and why do you have no shirt? Well to make a long story short, I was transported to the realm of the dragons and I became a dragon sage, Naruto said while pointing at the symbol above his heart. Jiraiya's face became serious and he said simply, tell me everything. Jiraiya stood completely stunned by the tale Naruto had just recited. He couldn't believe any of the things he heard and yet Naruto could prove them all. From the gashes on his back to the mark of the dragon on his chest, Naruto proved that his story was indeed real. Jiraiya took a deep breath to calm himself. The things this boy was telling him put him in a state of awe. To think that the dragons still existed and that this boy was able to summon them, Jiraiya chuckled and thought, he really is his father's son. So Naruto. Did these dragons tell you anything about what they can do or what they can teach you? Jiraiya asked. Naruto shook his head, coming to the realization that all he really saw them do was spitfire. Jiraiya held his chin in thought, there is usually some specialization when it comes to summons. He couldn't bring himself to believe that every dragon did the exact same thing so he said to Naruto, I want you to summon one. Naruto looked at him like he'd grown a second head, are you crazy? Those guys are huge. I can't summon them here. Just do it Naruto. He huffed as he moved some distance away from Jiraiya, bit his thumb and started going through the hand seals. He channeled his chakra and slammed his hand onto the ground. In a poof of smoke appeared. A very tiny reptilian. It was about a foot long, light blue with tiny wings and big eyes. Naruto stared down at his summon, dumbfounded. I thought you'd be a lot bigger, Naruto said to the dragon. The summon looked at Naruto and cocked its head to the side. Can't you speak? Naruto asked. In response the dragon cocked its head to the other side. Guess not, Jiraiya was still stunned in silence but finally his curiosity took over and he asked, so what exactly can he do? I don't know, 
He responded. Naruto looked to the tiny dragon and said, You wanna show us what you can do little guy? The flying reptile now turned its attention to Jiriya. He looked back to Naruto for a moment and then suddenly took off the ground and quickly latched onto Jiriya's arm. What the Jiriya was cut off when he saw the summon start sparking. If you looked close enough you could see arcs of electricity dancing around its small body and in between the spines on its back. This electric energy was then expelled in a sphere that enveloped most of the toad sage's arm. His arm began to convulse violently as pain shot through his system. Jiriya's face scrunched up in pain and he tried to bring his arm up to look at it but it came up too fast and he punched himself in the face sending him thundering to the ground. Naruto began vehemently laughing as Jiriya hit the ground and his summon came running back to him. The dragon quickly ran up Naruto's arm and jumped up onto his head where he laid down in his soft yellow hair. Naruto continued chuckling as Jiriya tried to figure how to get his arm to do as he commanded but no matter what he tried his arm continued to twitch and spasm. Jiriya growled and he stood up while trying to hold his arm in place. Naruto, he started. Just how big do these things get? I've seen one almost as tall as the Hokage Tower, Naruto responded. The old sage's heart stopped as he tried to fathom the kind of havoc a creature like that could inflict. He glanced toward the small blue summon atop Naruto's head and thought, especially since this tiny one was able to partially incapacitate me. He scoffed, imagine a widespread ability like this on the battlefield, such power. You know, I'm starting to like this little guy, Naruto said while looking upwards. The little guy seemed to sneeze and as a result Naruto's hair puffed out and got even spikier than it already was. Naruto chuckled and said, I think this calls for a celebration. Come on Aero Sensei you're paying for the ramen. Who said I was paying? Naruto stopped in his tracks and pointed to his new friend. I can make him get the other arm you know. Jiriya threw his hands up in surrender, or rather, hand as his other arm was still twitching wildly. He sighed and wondered how long this took to wear off. In the meantime he might as well enjoy some ramen with his new pupil. Sucks that he has to pay though. Naruto was walking down the streets of Konoha towards his favorite place in the world. Jiriya was walking beside him and his new friend who he had named Seiteki was nuzzled into Naruto's hair. Evidently Jiriya's arm had stopped twitching and he was feeling much better. As Naruto walked he noticed that the villagers were staring. Of course they were, he thought, they always do. But as he analyzed their features closer he realized that these weren't the stares he'd become accustomed to. Their eyes held no hatred or disgust but instead had shock and fascination. It seemed that everyone, from the civilians to the off-duty shinobi, were taken aback by the creature resting atop his head. Naruto chuckled softly, Seiteki must really be something for them to not be glaring at me right now he thought. He grinned wide when he saw the ramen shop in the distance. Naruto dashed off and yelled back, come on Aero sensei I'm hungry. This is going to hurt my wallet, Jiriya whined as he caught up with his new pupil. Naruto took a seat and waited for someone to greet him. Ayame stepped out of the back as Jiriya took a seat next to Naruto. Her eyes lit up as she saw her favorite customer. Naruto-kun, it's been so long how have you been? she asked. I've been good Ayame ne, it's been kinda hard training for the Chunin exams though, he answered. Ayame smiled but then she noticed some blue in his normally blonde hair. Upon closer inspection she noticed that this blue blob was scaly and moving. Naruto-kun what's on your head? She asked fearfully, knowing him it could be anything. Naruto lifted the summon off of his head and placed him on the countertop. Ayame finally got a good look at the creature and, small as it may be, it was still rather intimidating. This is my dragon summon, I call him Seiteki. Seiteki looked at Ayame and they locked eyes. Even though she was a simple civilian and never had shinobi training of any sort, she could see that this tiny creature held devastating power and potential. It was locked away waiting to be unleashed. Jiraiya spoke up for the first time, didn't we come here for food Naruto? Oh right. One bowl of miso ramen for me please. Same for me. Ayame tore her eyes away from the summon and said, coming right up, and she went to work on making them their meals. Naruto, I'm not sure if you should use your summons in the Chunin exams. They could easily kill your competition. Naruto looked surprised, he had just gotten the coolest summons and now he couldn't use them. 
Come on pervy sage I'm sure that everything will be fine, plus I know not to summon the really big ones, that's just overkill. Jiraiya sighed, he glanced toward Seiteki and laughed as the dragon had his tongue out due to the smell of ramen. Then he got an idea, Naruto, he shouted startling the blonde. As soon as we're done here we'll get right back to training, I know exactly what you can do to get stronger. Their food had arrived and after they finished eating Jiraiya said to Naruto, I need you to wait at the training grounds while I run some errands. Naruto deadpanned, you're not gonna peep on the hot springs again are you? Jiraiya scowled, no why don't you have any respect for your elders? Because you're a pervert, Naruto said matter of factly. Jiraiya walked away mumbling something about being a super pervert. The time for training was over. Jiraiya had taught him as best as he could and Naruto felt that he was ready. He stood in the ring silently, gazing over the immeasurable amount of people looking down from the stands above. He stood next to six others, all of them his competition. It seemed that some people were missing. As he looked towards his competition he realized that Sasuke was absent. Sakura gazed down into the arena and she began to worry. Where are Naruto and Sasuke? They can't miss this. Ino looked to her friend in confusion. Naruto is right there Sakura, standing next to Shikamaru. What? Sakura once again looked into the stadium and glanced to the figure beside Shikamaru. The figure in question looked up into stands and revealed his face. It was definitely Naruto but something was off, the clothes didn't match. To Sakura's surprise he wasn't wearing his regular orange attire but instead had black shinobi pants and sandals in a chain mesh shirt underneath a blue hooded jacket with the hood up. His sandals were the strangest though as they seemed to have a sort of metal trimming. Is that really Naruto? She wondered Naruto began to wonder about Sasuke's whereabouts. It isn't like Sasuke to miss something like this, even if he had to drag himself here. Alright everyone pay attention, there were some slight changes to the matchups, this is the new roster, take a good look at it. Everyone analyzed the matchups and after a minute the proctor spoke up once more, the terrain is different than the preliminaries but the rules are the same, the match continues until one contestant either forfeits or dies. The contestants for the first match are, Naruto Uzumaki and Neji Hayuga, the rest of you can head to the waiting area. The four others walked off leaving Naruto and Neji alone in the arena. They stared one another down each remembering the last words they'd spoken to each other. You got anything to say to me? Neji sneered. Only what I told you the last time. I vow to win. Neji analyzed everything about Naruto looking for signs of weakness, he found none. He has the look, he's determined and more sure of himself. No matter, destiny has decided me the winner. Let the first match of the finals begin, the proctor announced. I can't wait to see the look of despair on your face when you realize you made a promise you can't possibly k. Neji could not finish his sentence as Naruto flashed in front of him and landed a punch that sent him reeling. He quickly recovered and planted his feet, clutching his nose. He glared at Naruto who was in the same position with his fist still extended. I'll show you what happens when you fight destiny, he roared. Neji broke out into a run and jabbed at Naruto who slapped it away and threw a counter punch. Neji dodged it and once again jabbed at Naruto's chakra points. They continued this close counter exchange until Neji gained the upper hand, landing a blow on Naruto's shoulder that sent him rolling back a few feet. I missed, Neji thought. Do you understand now? You have no hope of beating me, he said. Naruto scoffed, get real. I was just checking you out is all. Naruto rose up off the ground and formed four clones. Neji could see the chakra networks of each clone and he noticed they were all identical. All four Naruto clones pulled a kanai and surrounded Neji. The original Naruto stayed back and watched as the clones charged in and as his opponent easily dodged attacks from all sides and danced around his clones as if they were untrained children. One by one his clones were dispatched by Neji in his gentle fist technique. This guy. He must have eyes in the back of his head. Neji looked over to Naruto menacingly. Why keep fighting? You were decided the loser once I was picked to be your opponent, Neji stated. Naruto scowled. All this talk about destiny, it may be the Hyuga way to cave into destiny but it's not mine, Naruto said with conviction. Suddenly Naruto's body erupted with energy. You could see small arcs of electricity all around him, and larger ones jumping from from limb to limb and from his fingertips to the ground. Although his hair was covered by the hood he was wearing you could tell each strand stood straight up. Neji looked in awe at his opponent. What is this? 
He wondered. He analyzed Naruto closer. Lightning jutsu. No, it's different. It's real. But then where could it be coming from? If one were to look closely they would see something shifting underneath Naruto's blue hood. Round number two, Naruto mumbled as he rushed forward towards his enemy. Naruto blurred out of sight and appeared only inches in front of Neji. Every muscle in Neji's body tensed and he struck out at the blonde blur, reacting on instinct alone. Naruto ducked under the strike and drove his fist deep into Neji's midsection. Neji flew back a few feet and rolled to a stop. Naruto's punch had caused some serious pain but what worried him even more was the electric current he could feel coursing through him. As he tried to rise back up to his feet his body began to convulse violently, resisting each attempt to move. Good, Naruto thought. His nerves are shot. What did you do to me? Neji roared in frustration. Wouldn't you like to know, Naruto said mockingly. Neji could see him gearing up for another attack, but he still couldn't maneuver well. Naruto shot forwards again, rearing back his leg to kick Neji in the chin. Neji had no other option than to just go limp and drop like a sack of potatoes. He fell to the ground and avoided the attack which sailed overhead. Neji rolled away as best as he could. Naruto continued his offensive onslaught and Neji continued to stumble and dodge until he once again had full control over his body. Neji jumped up onto his feet and scowled at Naruto. He was scuffed up from all of the attacks but he could still fight. So my cloak isn't as potent as Sadaki's attacks. I just need another solid hit, but this guy's like a slippery snake, Naruto thought. Neji also took this moment of calm to analyze his opponent. He realized that whatever this cloak was it increased Naruto's speed and strength while also making each attack debilitating. It is a quite deadly technique, he thought, but there must be a way around it. Both fighters were ready for another bout. They shot forward and began trade blows, each one dodging the other's strikes knowing how dangerous they were. Naruto threw a punch aimed at Neji's head. Neji slipped it and aimed a strike at a chakra point in Naruto's shoulder. Naruto dodged to the side and sent a kick towards Neji's midsection. The kick was moving much faster than his punches, must use rotation, Neji thought. He began to emit chakra from his whole body but the attack was too fast. The kick struck him and sent him stumbling. Naruto pressed his advantage and attacked again, but to his surprise Neji dodged it and created some distance between them. Naruto looked in awe at Neji who seemed to be checking the nerve response in his limbs. Neji's was surprised as well when he dodged that attack, he suddenly realized that the chakra he emitted for his rotation dampered Naruto's electrical cloak. Now Neji had the upper hand. For the first time he went on the offensive, he ran at Naruto and as Naruto lashed out with another kick, Neji coated his arm in chakra and caught it in the crease of his arm. Naruto's eyes went wide as Neji began to strike the chakra points in his leg. Naruto brought his other leg up and kicked at Neji's head. Neji blocked it but it rocked him and he released his grip on Naruto. He used this opportunity to escape, but the damage had been done. Naruto's leg was beginning to tense up. Naruto increased the distance between them once again. It seemed that for now the battle would continue this way, with short bursts of action and then separation. To engage in close combat for an extended period of time was dangerous for both contenders. Neji had recovered from the kick and was now analyzing Naruto in the same way. If the battle continued this way one of them may very well drop dead. His legs are dangerous Neji thought. I can't believe he already found a way around my cloak, thought Naruto. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X I can't believe he's really going toe to toe with Neji Hayuga, and he's holding his own, shouted Ino. Sakura was staring down at Naruto in awe, she couldn't believe that person in the arena was her goofy teammate. The teammate I always put down for being weak, Sakura thought solemnly. I guess Naruto's a lot stronger than you thought huh Sakura? Ino said turning to her friend. Yeah. I guess so, xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
In realization Naruto quickly retracted his arm and kicked at Neji's left side. Neji's eyes went wide as the lightning fast kick struck him, but not before he could damper the effects of the cloak. When the kick landed Neji flitched and Naruto used this split second to press the advantage. Naruto landed two solid hits into Neji's gut and one straight to his face that snapped his head back. Neji brought his arms up to defend. Naruto saw this and started to lock another kick. When Neji once again saw Naruto's leg moving at blistering speed he brought his arms down to defend, fearing the power of his kicks, but it was a feint. As soon as Neji's arms were out of the way Naruto stopped his kick and pummeled him with as many punches as he could to his face and body. I have to turn the tide. Neji thought in frustration. Neji coated his hand in chakra and as Naruto threw another powerful punch Neji caught it and retaliated with a palm strike to Naruto's jaw that snapped his head to the side and dazed him. What happened? Naruto thought. Wasn't I just winning? The crowd in the stands were roaring and buzzing with energy seeing the intensity of these hand-to-hand -hand bouts. Neji, now having the upper hand, struck as many chakra points as he could in Naruto's chest and arms. Naruto could feel every blow land, he could feel at least 10 or 12 strikes. Growing frustrated Naruto suddenly jumped into the air and brought up his knee to meet Neji's chin. Neji quickly tilted his head and jumped back. Naruto saw this as an opportunity and once more retreated to a safe distance. Naruto began to cough up some blood and he dropped to a knee breathing heavily. There was a strange wheezing sound coming from him and he realized that it was now very hard to breathe. As he looked over to Neji he could see that blood and bruises covered his face and as he looked even closer he could see Neji's entire body shaking and convulsing slightly. He was able to adapt quickly in order to stay in the fight, if I don't change tactics now one of us is gonna die. Naruto thought. Naruto strained to get to his feet. I wasn't expecting to use this in my first fight but there's no helping it. Naruto thought. Naruto began to slowly reach for his hood. Neji looked on curiously but stood tense and ready for another fight, but what happened next stunned him, as well as the rest of the crowd. The stands were full of cheering people and excitement but now it was deathly quiet. Each member of the audience was stunned into silence. Naruto had pulled down his hood to reveal Seiteki, a lump of blue laying in his blonde hair. Suddenly being exposed to light made him perk up. Seiteki blinked a couple times and took in the area. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
He hastily dropped the now electrified object but it was too late, the nerves in his arm were shot and the clones were upon him. He took the Jukin stance as best he could with one arm. As the first clone rushed toward him Neji spun and kicked the clone in the head that sent him sprawling to the ground. One down, Neji thought as he heard a poof. The two remaining clones engaged him together while the original stood back. Neji could only dodge their attacks as he waited to regain movement in his other arm. He now found himself surrounded by the three Naruto's in a sort of triangle. He remembered how in the beginning of the fight Naruto's clones rushed in. I can use rotation to dispatch of all of them simultaneously, Neji thought. Just as he suspected they all charged forward but as Neji began to expel his chakra and rotate his body Seiteki shot a bolt that stunned him. The Naruto's continued their charge and took hold of Neji, capturing both his arms putting him in a headlock. Now Seiteki. The original yelled. The dragon began to plummet at an incredible speed and he was headed straight for Neji. Seiteki smacked into Neji's chest with enough force to knock the air out of his lungs and he latched on. With Seiteki now in place the original released the headlock and watched as his summon began to glow and spark violently. Within the second Neji and the clones were enveloped in a sphere of electrical energy and the clones dispersed. Neji fell onto his back smoking slightly and Seiteki took to the sky once more. Neji stared up to the clouds dazed and tired. He could see a dark silhouette soaring through the sky. A bird free from its cage. The winner is Naruto Uzumaki. The stadium erupted into cheers and shouts of congratulations. Naruto simply looked up to them and smiled one of his rare genuine smiles. Naruto was walking up the steps to the waiting area, very slowly. He was holding on the railing and his breathing was ragged. Every step filled his legs with pain. Neji had got some good shots in. Naruto chuckled to himself. They don't call him a prodigy for nothing, he thought. He grew more serious as an image of Sasuke fall shed through his mind. He tightened his grip on the railing and his knuckles turned white. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X as he entered the waiting area he could see the Konoha 12 minus Sasuke and Neji. When he entered the area it suddenly got very quiet. He could tell that everyone was taking glances at him as he walked to stand next to Shikamaru. In the case of Sakura she was outright staring. He stood next to the shadow user and asked, How's it going Shika? He responded in his usual monotonous voice. Troublesome. Hey Naruto. What exactly is that thing? He asked pointing to Seiteki who was still stretching his wings over the arena. Naruto smiled broadly, raised two fingers to his mouth and whistled. Seiteki quickly changed direction and headed straight for his summoner. Seiteki landed on his head once more and began to netzel into his hair. This is my little buddy Seiteki, he's a dragon summon. Naruto stated while looking up at his blue friend. A dragon summon? I didn't know dragons existed, I thought they were a myth, Shikamaru thought. It seemed everyone else in the waiting area thought the same because none of them could take their eyes off of this living legend. As small as Seiteki was, especially compared to the rest of his family back home, he managed to stun these young ninja into silence. Suddenly Seiteki began to spark. Minuscule arcs jumped between the spines on his back. Seiteki reared his head back and sneezed. All of Naruto's hair instantly puffed up giving him a sort of blonde afro. Noise came back to the waiting area then, some of them laughed others started asking questions, enamored with this cute but dangerous creature. Strangely, one of the loudest members of the Konoha 12 was now silent. Sakura stood back watching as Naruto turned from person to person answering questions or laughing with them. She suddenly felt very alone. He didn't even look at me when he got up here, she thought. Frowning she furrowed her brow and stomped up to the blonde, she grabbed him and pulled him slightly aside. When their eyes met Naruto's smile dropped ever so slightly but no one could see that. What's up Sakura? He asked politely looking at her Naruto could tell she was upset about something. He simply stared at her and waited for a response. Sakura shifted uncomfortably as he stared at her. Why had she come up to him? Why did she care whether or not he greeted her? Was it because of his newfound strength? Or something else? These were the questions flowing through Sakura's mind and as Naruto began to speak she found an answer. Naruto. Do you think you could help me train? She asked with a blush. Although Sakura decided to go with strength as her answer for approaching him, there was something else gnawing at the back of her mind. 
After hearing her question Naruto was outright frowning. But a sad smile came to his face, almost as if he was reflecting on something. You see Sakura, he started. The past me would have loved to help you train but spending time with Aero Senen helped me realize something. You only ever talk to me when you want something from me. That's not true. Sakura objected. There have been so many times where you could have genuinely become my friend, hell, I wanted us to be even more than that, but every time you shot me down. You don't get any more second chances Sakura. Having said his piece Naruto turned and walked away. Sakura was now painfully aware of the lack of her usual Chan suffix and it stung. Bad. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Naruto drifted back over to Shikamaru and friends. Naruto was feeling good. When Jiraiya first explained to him how toxic Sakura was, he refused to believe it. But the more he thought about it, the more sense it made. He was hoping that maybe since he changed during his training, Sakura would have too. But Jiraiya always said he was too optimistic. A voice pulled him from his thoughts. By the way, that was a pretty good fight Naruto. I might be losing my mind but I actually think you were using your head. Shikamaru joked. Naruto laughed, I picked up a thing or two while training. A voice was heard from down in the arena. The next match is between Sasuke Uchiha and Gara of the Sand, will the contestants please enter the arena? Said the proctor. Gara was there in an instant. He had a very calm exterior but with every passing second his killing intent increased. Both the proctor and the crowd waited silently for the Uchiha. The last of his clan, finally they would be able to see him in action. Time continued to fly by and Naruto began to worry. Where is he? Naruto thought. At this rate he'll be disqualified and I won't get my fight. A full minute passed and the proctor broke the silence. The contestant Sasuke Uchiha has failed to enter the arena and thus is disqualified from the exams. There were shouts from the crowd, but in that moment smoke erupted from the arena's center and as it cleared it revealed a raven-haired boy and his cyclops of a sensei. Yo! We're not late are we? Kakashi asked nonchalantly. Just a little. Was the proctor's response. After a moment word passed down to the proctor that Sasuke Uchiha was not to be disqualified and the fight would proceed as planned. And the fight was not pushed back like in canon. That's a relief, Kakashi mumbled. He stepped out of the arena, leaving Sasuke and Gara to face off. Sasuke stared down his foe, not forgetting the tragedy that befell his previous opponent. Gara, on the other hand, had a calm exterior that betrayed the look in his eyes. His eyes held the look of a hungry predator and nothing else. Begin. The proctor shouted. Sasuke wasted no time and threw some kanai that were easily stopped by Gara's sand. In an instant Sasuke vanished from sight and appeared behind Gara. he threw a punch that mirrored the form of Rock Lee. He landed a blow to the face that sent Gara flying. He's like the other one, Gara thought. Slowly Gara rose to his feet and stared Sasuke down, daring him to attack once more. Sasuke obliged. He rushed in and ducked under an attack closing the distance quickly. When he was in range Sasuke doubled Gara over with a kick and followed up with another punch to his face. This time however, Gara was not sent flying, in fact he didn't move at all. The reason for this was a solid wall of sand that was being used as a brace, keeping him standing. Sasuke tried to retreat but couldn't detach his hand from Gara's face. From his doubled over position Gara's locked eyes with his prey. His face seemed to be melting into sand and that sand was slowly making its way up Sasuke's arm, trapping him. Sasuke's eyes widened in surprise. He released his sand armor in order to trap me, Sasuke realized. Did you think you could fight me like the other one? Did you think that I wouldn't adapt when a weakness was exposed? Gara let out a frightening cackle as he delighted in his opponent helplessness. Sasuke screamed in pain as the sand covering his left hand and wrist attempted to crush it. Fortunately for him the sand from just Gara's armor wasn't able to place enough pressure to break the bone. It was fractured but not broken. Almost simultaneously, a tendril of sand wrapped itself around his leg and threw him into the stadium walls causing it to crack. Gara kept up the onslaught and tried to crush Sasuke under, you guessed it, more sand. Sasuke quickly rolled out of the way and got on his feet. He continuously dodged attack after attack before reaching into his pouch pulling as many smoke bombs as he could and tossing them into the air. They burst and covered the battleground in thick smoke. 
Sasuke activated his Sharingan giving him the advantage. Even through all the smoke Sasuke could see Gara and the sand he pumped his chakra through. Gara was turning in every direction at every little sound looking for his opponent. Come out Sasuke Uchiha. Mother wants your blood. What's wrong with this guy? Sasuke thought. He quickly thought of a plan and reached into his bag for another kanai. Recalling the terrain, he could distinctly remember some trees that stood tall on the other side of the arena. Sasuke pictured his surroundings as best as he could and tied a paper bomb to his kanai. Launching the kanai across the arena Sasuke allowed himself a moment's celebration as he heard the thunk of a kanai hitting wood. Gara Quickie turned to this sound showing his back to Sasuke and as the paper bomb exploded, two things happened. 1. Sasuke began to charge up his trump card. 2. Gara began to wildly attack anything he could in the direction the explosion came from, laughing as he did. After a minute of attacking without hearing any screams of death and pain Gara stopped to listen once more. He turned to a new sound that was coming from behind him. It sounded like chirping birds and it was getting closer very quickly. Through the smoke Gara could see a blue glow screeching toward him, and before he could react it was in front of him. Sasuke reared back and attempted to plunge his arm through his opponent's chest but at the last moment a pillar of sand shot up slowing down the attack significantly. Sasuke's hand went through the pillar and stopped just before Gara's heart, drawing blood in the process. Sasuke was stuck once more but Gara was too stunned to take advantage. Gara stared down as he felt a warm liquid touch his skin. He finally came to the realization that he was bleeding. Suddenly Gara let out the loudest most blood-curdling scream that made everybody's hairs stand on end. Even the cage were standing at full attention now, although for different reasons. Sasuke gulped and his heart started to race as he futilely struggled to escape. The sand began to move erratically in every direction with most of it swirling around Gara as he continued to scream. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Tamari, Konkuro and their sensei Baki were in the stands dumbfounded as to what just happened. They had shot out of their seats in panic after seeing Sasuke use his Chidori. He hurt him, he actually hurt him, Tamari exclaimed. This isn't good, he wouldn't transform right now would he? yelled Konkuro. Let's hope not. The entire operation hinges on Gara. Transformation this early would be disastrous. We just aren't ready, and if that boy is anything to go on, the leaf shinobi are tough. Baki calmly stated. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Gara had never stopped screaming and as he continued, the screams became more pained and animalistic. His sand seemed to be consuming him now. It crawled out from the gourd on his back onto the right side of his face and down his right arm, morphing him into a half-human half-sand beast. The sand was gathering around Gara and molding onto his body. What was holding Sasuke hostage had retreated to form part of Gara's transformed arm. Although he was free, Sasuke could only stare at the monster that stood before him. The killing intent radiating off of him was palpable. Gara's half-demonic face looked up and locked eyes with Sasuke. One of his eyes was yellow and his teeth on that side had been elongated into razor-sharp knives. Sasuke could feel that eye gazing into him, promising one thing. Death. Sasuke gulped and took a step back. In that same instant Gara swung his transformed arm through the air, batting Sasuke away like a fly. Sasuke's body soared through the air and rolled to a stop on the ground. The power of that one swipe was enough to crack ribs. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Everyone in the stands were buzzing with excitement, waiting to see what would happen next. They were all wondering if Gara was even human and if the Uchiha boy still had a chance. Strangely, feathers to began to fall in front of their faces, and their excitement was replaced by a drowsy feeling. One by one, citizens began to fall into a deep sleep. Higher level ninja like Kakashi and perceptive genin like Shikamaru quickly dispelled the genjutsu. Unfortunately in Naruto's case, he was sleeping with his face on the dirty floor. On the other hand, Seiteki was still up and about. The dragon delivered a small shock to Naruto jolting him back into the real world. Wa! Was what Naruto mumbled out. 
x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x x that's the signal to move out prepare yourselves baki said as he prepared for battle but wait it's still too early there's no way that all of our forces are prepared for the assault yet tamari shrieked baki gave his student a hard glare the signal was given now it's time for you to do your job Tamari was shaking, her nerves were all over the place. Regardless, she grabbed her fan and got ready. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Sand and Sound Shinobi began to pour out of their hiding places, clashing with the Leaf Shinobi. At the sight of this the third Hokage prepared himself for what he knew would come next. In that moment the K's cage attacked and the battle was on. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Naruto was slowly rising up from the floor trying to comprehend what was happening. There were tiny skirmishes breaking out all over the stadium, but why? Naruto. He heard a voice yell. It was Sakura, she was running toward him. What's happening? Naruto frantically asked. The sand and sound are attacking the village. Kakashi sensei told me to go around and break as many people out of the genjutsu as I can. So that's what put me to sleep, Naruto thought. He looked around and focused his gaze in the center of the arena. The fight between Sasuke and Gara was still raging on and it was not looking good for Sasuke. Without saying another word to Sakura he leapt over the railing and down into the arena with Seiteki following close behind. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Sasuke was getting battered. He just couldn't compete with the power of Gara's transformation. He dodged as many hits as he could, but there was no end in sight. In an open field like this, with nowhere to hide and no way to retreat, all Sasuke could do was survive. Suddenly, for the first time, Gara stopped his relentless attacks and turned to catch a kanai in his sand arm. In the next second, there was an explosion and the sand was blown off of his arm. Naruto landed next to Sasuke. You all right? He asked. Gara glared with pure hatred at the blonde ninja as his arm reformed. I didn't ask for your help, Sasuke said, but you needed it, Naruto replied. He sent a glare over to Naruto but noticed Seiteki sitting on his head. He blinked and for a moment wondered if he was seeing things. In the end he decided to ask about it later. Seiteki, Naruto whispered, get his other arm. Seiteki nodded and quickly fired an electric shot that slammed into Gara's regular arm. Pain shot through his body but was dampered on his transformed side. Naruto quickly activated his electric cloak and kicked Gara in the head, which caused him to stumble a bit. Sasuke didn't miss the opening and rushed in the plant his foot in Gara's chest sending him tumbling backwards. As Gara got back on his feet Naruto and Sasuke continued to keep up the pressure. Their string of combo attacks finally ended with Sasuke kicking the back of his leg to bring him to his knees and Naruto following up with a hard kick to Gara's face. They both stepped back. They were breathing hard, but felt proud of themselves and of their teamwork. But alas, Gara rose to his feet once more. There was glint in his bloodshot eye, like he was enjoying this. More and more sand began to latch onto his body, leaving only his legs exposed and forming a tail. I think we made him angry, Naruto quipped. Why won't he just stay down? Sasuke shouted. Gara placed both his hands on the ground in front of him and took up a strange position. Naruto realized what he was going to do but it was too late. Oh, shit, was his only thought. It played like slow motion in his head. Gara propelled himself forward using his arms, shooting past Naruto and grabbing Sasuke in his hands. Gara continued to soar through the air until he slammed Sasuke into the concrete walls. Naruto heard the impact before he could even turn around to see what happened. As he turned to see, Gara punched Sasuke with all his might, pushing him deeper into the hole in the concrete and knocking him unconscious. Gara was about to keep going until the Uchiha was dead, but he was hit by one of Seiteka's attacks. He turned to look at Naruto, completely unfazed. Gara's yellow, inhuman eyes glowed with murderous intent as he prepared to repeat what he'd just done. But as he took the same stance, he suddenly began to scream incoherently. Yes, mother, he said shakily after some time. Sleep possum jutsu. 
Gara erupted into a mountain of sand that took the form of a gargantuan tanuki. It was Shukaku the sand spirit. Naruto looked up at this beast with a sense of hopelessness. Unconsciously, he glanced at his wrist. The sleeve was rolled back just enough to expose Chishiki's mark. They were his last hope, but it would take almost everything he had to summon them. Naruto pulled back his sleeve, bit his thumb and wiped the blood across all three marks. There were two giant puffs of smoke and Naruto dropped to his hands and knees, completely exhausted. In front of him stood Chishiki and Chikara in all their magnificence. Seeing these two stand in front of him, he felt hope return to his heart. Breathing heavily Naruto mumbled, I still have a chance. Chishiki and Chikara stood proudly side by side in front of Naruto, as if they were his shields protecting him from harm. Chishiki stood calmly and seemed to be prepared for anything. Chikara on the other hand, seemed ecstatic. He was almost bouncing with excitement. The first time you summon me and you pit me against Shukaku? I'm beginning to like you brat. You seem very pleased brother. Chishiki noted. Of course I am, it's been too long since my last true fight. Chikara stated. Naruto was still on the ground observing the two dragons before him. It was then he realized there was a brother missing. Hey, where's Jakuna? He asked. Chishiki turned to him upon hearing the question. You attempted to summon all of us at once but did not have enough chakra. You are now suffering from minute chakra exhaustion. Notice the ragged breathing and fatigue. So summoning you two took everything I had. Then, will I ever be able to summon him? Naruto said as an image of the Dragon King flashed through his mind. In any case, I recommend you sit back and let us handle the threat. We are not at full strength without our brother but we should be able to handle the one tails. Naruto nodded his head and slowly made his way over to where Sasuke was still embedded in the wall. As he approached the battle between beasts had begun but he ignored it for the moment. Naruto dropped down and pulled Sasuke out of his hole and checked his pulse. Naruto let out a sigh of relief upon feeling a slow but steady pulse. With the thought of Sasuke's untimely death out of his mind, he now focused his attention on the battle unfolding before him. As Naruto was making his way toward Sasuke, Shukaku and the dragons sized each other up. Chikara and Chishiki were smaller than Shukaku but they had many advantages. For one, there were two of them. They were also much more agile and together they had sufficient firepower. Within an instant the battle roared to life and every living creature in the area could feel the power emanating from these three. Chikara was the first to attack, spitting out a fireball that exploded upon contact with Shukaku's face sending blackened sand in every direction. The damage was minimal and regenerated in a matter of seconds. It would take much more to take down one of the biju. Shukaku responded by hurling dense balls of sand at an incredible speed towards the two dragons. Reacting quickly they both took to the skies to dodge the attack. The sand impacted the ground, sending dirt and rocks many feet into the air. Without hesitation Chikara exhaled white hot flames that engulfed Shukaku as he tried his best to block it with his arm. Chishiki held back and watched intently, analyzing his opponent before deciding on the best course of action. As Chikara's flames died down he was preparing to dive in and shatter the glass that was created but upon closer inspection Shukaku's arm had only been blackened and was smoking slightly. Chikara, seeing that his flames were ineffective, quickly retreated and met up with Chishiki to see if he came up with anything. His sand is more heat resistant than I thought, what can we do? Chikara asked. I thought I told you to consult with me before attacking, Chishiki said slightly irritated. They quickly had to separate in order to dodge a powerful air bullet shot from below. Chikara deadpanned and asked, is this really the time? I suppose not. In any case if your flames do not work we must work together. If we combine our breath attacks then we may be able see significant results. You use too many fancy words brother. Yes, yes I know, he said exasperated. Suddenly Shukaku's arm cut through the air, nearly knocking Chikara out of the sky. Chishiki looked down in confusion, as they should have been out of his range for physical attacks. The arm fell back down to the ground causing the ground to shake. Chishiki could see that it was disturbingly long. Evidently Shukaku had taken the sand from his other arm and moved it to make one extremely long arm like lasso. He continued to fling this monstrosity into the air cackling like a madman while he did it. 
it cut through the air with surprising speed and would do serious damage if it actually connected. Luckily for the dragon duo Shukaku somehow managed to hit himself in the head while the arm fell back down to earth, causing him to get angry and throw it into the arena wall instead. He's insane. Chishiki noted. Thirty feet to the right of where Naruto was sat with Sasuke, the arena wall exploded. Shukaku's casual toss of his arm had obliterated the solid concrete barrier. Naruto's heart was pounding and he desperately wanted to move to a safer area but he didn't have the energy and he didn't want to leave Sasuke unattended. He could not believe the power that this creature held and was also amazed that his summons were holding out. He moved his attention to the surrounding area, the sand and sound shinobi were being dealt with slowly and their numbers were dwindling. Naruto's eyes widened for a moment as he realized something. The cage seats were empty and that only meant one thing. He searched every inch in his immediate vicinity before seeing some explosions going off on a nearby rooftop. He could vaguely make out two figures clashing. Naruto's heart seemed to stop. Gigi is strong but he's too old to fight. If that's really him over there why is no one helping? Naruto was ripped from his worries by a feeling of life-threatening danger and his attention was brought back to the battle between beasts. Chishiki and Chikara were trying to keep their distance. They felt Shukaku gathering power and wanted to be cautious. Orbs of blue and red were gathering together to form a dark sphere in front of Shukaku's mouth. They see could tell from the look of this thing that being hit by it meant certain death. Shukaku had completely formed the orb and aimed it at Chikara, who was going to begin flying up into the clouds as to not be seen. His ascent was cut short however as something grabbed onto one of his legs. A stiff pillar of sand had extended from where Shukaku threw his arm and was keeping him in place. Chikara struggled to escape and even tried once again to utilize his flames but Shukaku launched his attack. The Biju Bomb, this orb of pure destructive energy was hurtling towards Chikara and for the first time he felt completely powerless. As the Biju Bomb was mere inches from his body, he erupted into smoke and disappeared. Naruto had sent him back to the throat of the world. The sphere of death continued on into the air and exploded, blasting away every cloud in the sky. Although he was relieved his brother had escaped in time, now Chishiki was left alone to face off against the One Tails. My chances of success have dropped significantly, he thought. He had an idea but without Chikara it would be much harder. Shukaku seemed to be celebrating the fact that he killed, Chikara and Chishiki took this moment to land next to Naruto. I need your help, do you know any fire jutsu? He said cutting to the chase. No, but. Naruto looked down at Sasuke. He knelt down and shook the boy while also yelling in his ear. Surprisingly, even after the damage he took, Sasuke awoke looking confused. Sasuke we need your help, can you stand? He was dazed and flinching from the pain, and then he saw what Gara had become. He couldn't believe that monster used to be a person. He was also completely astounded at the sight of a giant lizard with wings. It wasn't even the fact that dragons were real that caused him to falter but more that in the presence of this creature, the power of human shinobi seemed insignificant. Naruto's words finally sunk in and he nodded. Sasuke slowly began to rise, using the wall as support. He could feel his muscles aching and every draw of breath caused him pain. As he righted himself he asked, what do you need me for? We should get off the ground first, I will inform you afterwards. Chishiki quickly scooped them up and tossed them onto his back before taking off once again. He soared above Shukaku's head which caused the biju to refocus his attention. Shukaku was quick to resume attacking and shot four air bullets hoping to knock Chishiki out of the sky. Hang on tight. Chishiki rolled left and right to avoid the attacks and when he saw an opportunity he struck. The dragon brother opened his mouth and something began to take form, gathering in front of his maw. It shaped into a point, almost like a bullet, but it seemed to chill the air around it. As a matter of fact the moisture in the air was freezing upon contact and wisps of chilling smoke fell off it before dissipating. Naruto was amazed at the sight before him. It's an ice attack. I thought dragons only used fire. I can't wait to learn more. Naruto thought. Chishiki propelled the icicle forward, and then he shot another and another. Each one pierced Shukaku's body and crashed into the ground behind him, leaving gaping holes in their wake. But the sand spirit, ever resilient, stood unfazed as the holes in his body closed slowly. It is as I feared, we need a way to destroy the whole body at once. How can we do that? He's huge, Naruto exclaimed. This is where your friend comes in. 
if he combines his fire with my ice. The water will melt his body, Naruto interrupted. Precisely, Sasuke stayed silent. This was all so strange to him, almost as if he was dreaming. Dragons and monsters. It just seemed so unreal. But there he was, hundreds of feet off the ground and on the back of a talking dragon. Maybe he was dreaming. Can you do it Sasuke? Naruto roused him from his thoughts. What? Can you use your fire with his ice? Sasuke was about to say, I don't know, that he wasn't sure he had the chakra, but there was something about the way Naruto was looking at him. Like he was trying to figure out exactly how strong Sasuke was, trying to figure out if he was better. Sasuke grew determined and nodded, he then moved to stand on Chishiki's head, better positioning himself for what was to come. Ready, Sasuke said. Chishiki unleashed a wave of what looked like smoke, but in reality it was trillions upon trillions of tiny, razor-sharp ice shards. An attack like that would quickly rend the flesh off of any who stood in its path. Sasuke immediately went through the hand's signs and released his flames. The combination attack resulted in a torrent of water crashing down onto the tailed beast, soaking into his body and causing it to slide and shift unnaturally. Get your nasty liquids off me! Shukaku roared Sasuke's flames began to die down but Naruto couldn't let that happen, the sand demon was still standing. Naruto placed his hand on Sasuke's back and instantly the Uchiha could feel it. It felt like two bodies of water being connected, except that Naruto's was vastly larger than his own. Even though Naruto was also running low on chakra Sasuke could feel just how cavernous his reserves really were. When did you get this strong? Sasuke wondered. The flames roared back to life as what was left of Naruto's chakra came rushing in. The water continued to pour down on Shukaku who futility tried to escape. His limbs were crumbling, barely holding together and he continued to rant all the while. Finally, Naruto and Sasuke gave out, panting and out of breath they peered down to see a huge uneven pile of wet sand. Some parts of the pile were towered up and huge and the rest was almost flat. Chishiki seemed very pleased with himself but Naruto and Sasuke were too tired to even celebrate. Sasuke seemed to have it worse, his eyes were heavy and it looked like he was going to fall unconscious once again. You okay? Naruto asked. Not dead. Just. Don't drop me. Sasuke droned out. He let sleep take him and went limp. Naruto snorted at the thought of Sasuke falling off Chishiki but held him securely. We should land now, Naruto said. Chishiki obliged and landed in the arena where there was the least sand. Naruto hopped off his back and set Sasuke down to rest. Suddenly he heard a rumbling. It was coming from the largest pile of sand. As Naruto stared at it he could see it moving slightly, and then he could see yellow eyes peering at him. Shukaku was still alive. His limbs were all but dissolved, his face was disfigured and his body was halfway melted into the ground but he was still there. Somehow this dissolved, melted version of Shukaku was even more terrifying than the original. The sand where Shukaku's mouth would be began to part slowly and just like before blue and red orbs began to gather. Chishiki acted quickly, blowing out his chilling smoke and flapping his wings to spread the cold faster. The effect was almost instant, the water soaked in Shukaku was rapidly chilled and he began to frost over, causing the attack to stop. Naruto let out a breath he didn't know he was holding and thanked Chishiki before moving to finish the fight once and for all. He searched through Sasuke's pouch and grabbed all the explosive tags he could and combining them with his own he rolled them into a ball of death. Naruto aimed for Shukaku's still open mouth and chucked the explosives in. Kobe, Chishiki muttered. What? Nothing, Naruto quickly dismissed the strange comment and activated the bomb. Energy erupted out from Shukaku's belly sending frozen sand flying in every direction and finally destroying the tailed beast's body. Gara was also shot out of the sand, he was unconscious and wasn't going to wake up anytime soon. Unfortunately for our favorite blonde knucklehead, there is no rest for the weary and in the same moment that Gara hit the ground, an explosion came from that building he'd noticed before. He could feel the pressure wave slam into his chest and he realized then that the battle taking place was far beyond his skill level. Even so, the thought of losing one of his precious people caused him to make rash decisions. He hopped onto Chishiki's back and took off towards the mayhem. I'm on my way Gigi. Naruto was drained of energy but he couldn't stop, if there was even the smallest chance that he could help his Gigi then he would give everything he had left. As he soared through the air on Chishiki's back he felt the wind blowing past, whipping his hair and clothes in every direction. 
he was struggling to keep his eyes open and now he was truly feeling the effects of chakra exhaustion. We're nearly there, the dragon stated. As Naruto looked up he could see the battle very clearly now. There was a single man facing off against the Hokage and a couple of Anbu. There were some bodies strewn about and what seemed to be a forest growing out of the building. The roots of the trees had grown throughout the building, burrowing into the walls and floors. Also, some of the roof had caved in from the explosions, creating pitfalls that sometimes went down multiple floors. At the same moment that Chishiki cautiously touched down onto the roof, a couple of leaf shinobi arrived as well. Some of them immediately engaged in battle with the pale snake man and others moved to report to the Hokage. Hokage-sama we have forced the San shinobi to retreat but there are still some from sound lingering about. The rest of our platoon will be arriving shortly. The Hokage nodded, never taking his attention away from the opponent. Naruto observed the man as well, he could see that this enemy was leaps and bounds more powerful than him, in his current state he didn't stand a chance. Give up Orochimaru. Your plan is failing before your eyes. Are you truly willing to die here? Hirazin shouted. The man, who Naruto now knew as Orochimaru, hissed back his response. Your threats are empty sensei, I've nothing to fear from this pitiful village. You've become a monster, and this time I will not hesitate to destroy you. The old man truly sounded his age as he said this. You could tell this was not a fight he enjoyed. He buried his emotions and resumed the onslaught. The Anbu and the Hokage were putting pressure on Orochimaru, causing him to fight defensively, blocking attacks and retaliating every so often with a jutsu. Although he fought alone, he was holding his own, even killing one of the leaf shinobi. Hirazen was on a whole different level though, he continued to slip attacks past Orochimaru's guard dealing significant damage. The full power of a cage was being put on display, withered old man or not. Naruto desperately wanted to join in and provide whatever support he could, but he had no chakra left at all and Chishiki's attacks would endanger the leaf shinobi as well. For now he could only wait. As Hirazen landed a blow that sent Orochimaru flying, something happened that changed the entire flow of the battle. Four sound shinobi appeared on the scene, they had strange markings covering their bodies and they wasted no time going to work. They were able to single-handedly dispatch of chunin level shinobi and work together for Jonin and Anbu. The leaf's numbers were dropping quickly. In his fatigue Naruto was struggling to follow exactly what was happening, his brain couldn't process these sudden radical changes in the situation. He watched in confusion and a bit of fear as the sound four beat back most of the leaf shinobi and surrounded the Hokage. Together they formed a square of sorts, with Naruto at one of the corners. The strange red-headed girl had appeared a few meters in front of him and began to go through hand signs. Before anyone could react a large purple barrier was erected that burned whatever touched it on contact. Everyone there learned that lesson very quickly after seeing a comrade rush in without thinking. As the barrier rose up the rest of the leaf platoon arrived on the scene. Some timing. Naruto thought sarcastically. In any case, the battle slowed to a standstill. The shinobi on the outside could not get in and the hokage along with a couple subordinates were stuck on the inside. After a moment Naruto hopped down onto the roof and began to approach the platoon waiting on the outside. What are you guys doing? You need to get in there, Naruto exclaimed. There was a single Anbu member on the outside trying to give orders and he turned to Naruto, revealing his owl mask. That's what we're trying to do. You should get out of here kid, it's not safe. Naruto looked at him defiantly and said, Fukuro-san, I am a leaf shinobi and I will fight to protect my village, he tapped his headband for emphasis. The Anbu looked tired and decided not to argue. He said, well look, we have some guys trying to come up with something to take down this barrier, so just stand by until then. Suddenly a shout could be heard from inside the barrier. As Naruto looked over he could see an Anbu member being held up in the air by snakes that extended from Orochimaru's arms. A snake slithered up his body and bit him in the neck. He was released and he fell limply back down to the ground. Dead. The venom had killed him in mere seconds. Naruto's eyes widened and he began to panic, fear nestled into his very soul as he thought about what would happen to his grandfather figure. Suddenly he was very alert now. Adrenaline was coursing through his body and his eyes began to dart around, searching for any way to get through the barrier. He wouldn't be able to do much fighting, if any at all, but he had to help somehow. If he could get the platoon through the barrier, they could win. As he searched, his eyes landed on each of the sound four and his brain began to slowly put the pieces together. 
he turned to the Anbu, now dubbed Fukuro, and spoke up. This barrier needs all four of those guys to keep it up, right? Naruto asked. That's what we think, it's either that or each one of them adds strength to it and only one is needed to erect it. So in either case we don't need to attack the barrier itself, we need to attack them. Fukuro replied in an exasperated voice. We've tried that already, they're protected from the inside and the outside. No attack can get through. Naruto frowned as his mind sifted through possibility after possibility but he drew a blank. Then he heard something he never wanted to hear. It was a voice filled with shock and horror. H. Hokage-sama. Naruto forced himself to look, slowly turning his head to peer into the battlefield. He did not like what he saw. Hirazen Sortobi, the god of shinobi, stood defensively in front of what few subordinates he had left. There was a snake biting his forearm. Kanai stuck in his shoulder, and a blade piercing his side. The cage had seen what the venom could do so thinking quickly, he detached the snake from his forearm, grabbed a kanai and dragged it down the entire length of his arm, draining most of the poison. He would live for now, but he was losing a lot of blood. Everyone on the inside looked worn down, barely holding on, and from the looks of it the Hokage would die soon. Naruto went cold. Chishiki, he yelled out in a panicked and fearful voice. Yes. Get me in there. Now. I can only think of one way in, but it is potentially dangerous. You need to get me in there. Naruto said. He was almost begging at this point. Chishiki nodded. He understood that when humans were filled with emotions it was very difficult to get them to listen to reason. He just hoped that what he was about to do didn't cause too much damage, since the building was already structurally compromised. He better positioned himself behind the red-headed girl and got ready. Seeing that the powerful summon was about to do something drastic Naruto and the rest of the leaf platoon had stepped back to a safer distance, though no one was exactly sure what distance was safe when it came to a beast like Chishiki. The dragon reared back on his hind legs, standing to his full height, and then slammed his front legs back down onto the roof with as much power as he could muster. The impact shook the entire building and sent vibrations all the way down to the ground. It was essentially an artificial earthquake. The red-headed girl that was holding up the barrier was immediately thrown into the air causing the barrier to be released. She wasn't the only thing that got flung into the sky however, rubble shot out and began to cause even more damage. It connected with other buildings causing pieces to fall off and cracks to form. Some of it even managed to hit members of the leaf platoon. The building creaked and groaned in protest to this power, in an instant the whole side where Chishiki had struck was collapsing crushing whatever was in the way and cracking the stone paths as they fell to the ground below. Chishiki steered clear of the falling debris with his wings. This whole thing took less than five seconds but it played in slow motion for Naruto, he could see rubble whizzing by his face and he saw the girl falling, her eyes were wide like she didn't know what was happening. He could even see the cracks forming as the side of the building imploded. He kept his eyes locked onto the girl though, she flailed about in the air, hopelessly moving in an attempt to somehow stop the effects of gravity but alas, she continued to fall. As she hit the ground all her movement stopped. He stared at her prone form for a moment before thinking to himself. A fall like that wouldn't kill her, right? She's probably just unconscious, with some broken bones. Naruto heard a shout and saw that the platoon rushed forward to protect the Hokage. Hiruzen refused to let them fight on their own and began to launch jutsu after jutsu contributing as much as he could to pushing the enemy back, all while having a sword stuck through his side. The snake man was outnumbered and overwhelmed. He ordered his three henchmen to retreat and some Jonin gave chase, within a few seconds they were out of Naruto's field of view. I hope they catch those guys he thought. Naruto ran to see his Gigi and as the old warrior saw the blonde coming, a look of surprise came to his face, then he smiled. It was a smile full of pride, just from looking at Naruto he could tell that the boy fought hard today. But there was no time for words, the old man began to cough up blood and felt very weak. Naruto couldn't believe the state of him, he was bloody and battered, with a sword protruding from his body, not to mention the small amount of venom still coursing through him, and yet he continued to stand on his own. Someone started to shout out orders. I need someone to get Hokage-sama to the Ur now, and somebody put a chakra suppression seal on that girl then throw her in the infirmary so we can check her wounds. But she's the enemy, someone shouted. An enemy with information. The way the man said that was almost sinister, but Naruto brushed it off. 
As Hiruzen was taken away to be treated Naruto turned to Chishiki with his eyes half-lidded and nearly unconscious. Thank you. For everything. There's nothing left for you to do now. The bottle's over. Naruto said tiredly. Chishiki nodded and said, You are in need of rest, make certain that you get it. Before poofing away. Naruto looked up to the sky, the sound of fighting had fatted away and the birds were chirping again. Naruto could no longer stand up straight. He was swaying on his feet, his breathing was ragged, his vision blurred, and even his hearing seemed muffled. You okay kid? Fukuro asked. Naruto gave him a confused look, he took a single step forward before passing out. Fukuro moved to catch him. You did good kid, let's get you to the infirmary. His face scrunched up as the light filtered into his squinted eyes. He sat up, and as he looked around, all he could see was white. White bed, white walls, white floors. He knew where he was now, the memories began to flood into his mind. He looked down to see himself in a gown. There was an IV stuck in his arm and he felt slightly fatigued. He knew what happened to him but had no idea how he got here. He furrowed his brow trying to recall his last few moments of consciousness. Then it hit him. Fukuro-san must have brought me here. I'll have to say thank you if I ever see him again. Naruto felt something rustling under the covers. As he looked over, a scaly blue head popped up and locked eyes with him. Seiteki! Naruto exclaimed. The small dragon jumped onto Naruto's lap and began to hop up and down excitedly. Naruto chuckled at the hyper dragon's antics. I guess you found a safe place to hide once Shukaku came out huh? I'm glad you're okay. Naruto began to pet Seiteki's head, which was much smoother than it appeared. Small arcs of electricity began to jump between the spines on Seiteki's back and he made a low rumbling sound. I guess that means he likes it. Naruto thought with a smile. The door to his room swung open and Naruto could see a woman holding a clipboard. She was wearing a nurse outfit and was young and attractive. Naruto looked at her as she stepped to the front of his bed without looking up. She finally took her eyes off the clipboard to see Naruto staring at her. Oh, you're awake. Quite the fast healer, aren't you? You were only out for a day. Yup. He said grinning. Well in that case I'll need to do a checkup. She placed the clipboard down and walked to the side of the bed. Her hands began to glow and she placed them onto Naruto's bare back. Naruto blushed a little, her hands were soft and very warm. He heard her speak up. I saw your fight with the Hyuga boy, you know. I thought you were amazing, and so was he. She said nodding to Seiteki. The small dragon puffed out his chest with pride, making the nurse giggle. A grin spread across Naruto's face, he'd never had anyone beside his Gigi praise him before. I heard some rumors about you too. Rumors? Rumors like what? Naruto asked. Really weird ones, she said laughing. People say that you fought a devil and some others say that you single-handedly saved Hokage-sama. People come up with the craziest things don't they? I wouldn't say those are totally wrong. Naruto stated. I did fight a huge monster and I was there to help the others save Gigi. I mean, Hokage-sama. The nurse looked at this boy in complete shock. The words coming out of his mouth were completely outlandish, but she couldn't see any signs of it being a lie. How is he anyway? Naruto asked. What? The nurse asked, breaking from her thoughts. The Hokage. How is he? I'd like to see him. Oh. The doctors finished operating on him sometime yesterday, but I don't think they're accepting visitors. Her hands stopped glowing and she said, Well, you seem fine, so you can leave whenever you'd like. Your belongings are in the cabinet over there. Thank you. The nurse carefully removed the IV and once again grabbed the clipboard. She began to walk out of the room. She was excited to tell someone how she got to do a checkup on the boy who helped save the Hokage. It still sounded crazy just thinking about it. Naruto rose up out of bed and moved to the cabinet to readorn his chain mesh, blue hoodie, black shinobi pants, and sandals. Seiteki once again sat upon his throne, in other words Naruto's head, and Naruto pulled the hood up so the dragon could sleep better. I should try to see Gigi, he thought. Naruto exited the room then looked left and right. He paused, to his right, all the way down the hall there was a room with a Jonin guard standing by the door. Naruto began to think. Obviously the Hokage's room would be guarded, but I doubt it would be by a single Jonin. They probably have that red-haired girl in there. He continued walking through the halls in search of where the Hokage was resting, it was a bit hard to find because anyone he asked refused to give him a direct answer. 
After a couple minutes of wandering he spotted two Anbu standing guard. Bingo, Naruto walked up to them and was immediately stopped by the one to his left. Stop. You are not permitted past this point. The man was very forceful and Naruto was about to turn back, seeing as how there was no way he could sneak past these two Anbu, but then he heard a familiar voice. You here to see the cage kid? Naruto looked to his right and saw the man who brought him here. Fukuro-san. I didn't think I'd see you again. Thank you for bringing me here. Well I couldn't just leave you passed out on the roof of a collapsing building, could I? Naruto snickered and the other Anbu asked, you know him? I do. Was Fukuro's simple response. Can you please let me see him, I won't take too long, I promise. Naruto asked. We are under strict orders to, Fukuro cut off his partner. You might not want to see him kid, he's in pretty rough shape. You're not supposed to tell him to, now Naruto cut him off. That's why I need to see him. Naruto protested. Fukuro stared at Naruto for a moment, like he was analyzing him, which was unsettling for Naruto because he couldn't see his eyes but he could feel them on him. His eyes were piercing, like an owl's. After a moment Fukuro suddenly spoke. Sure kid. Let him in, he's good. Are you sure? You'd be ignoring your orders, again. It won't be a problem if no one knows, Fukuro said slyly. His partner just sighed and said, fine. Thank you Fukuro-san. Fukuro simply nodded and Naruto walked through the door into the room and shut the door behind him. Do you think he'll be alright? After seeing that? I don't know, but he's a tough kid. Fukuro answered. Naruto walked into the room. It was dimly lit and he could hear the beeping of the equipment. There was a curtain up ahead that was shielding one of the beds from view. Naruto approached it and slowly pulled it open. The very next second he forcefully pulled it back into place, obscuring the bed once again. Naruto's heart dropped and he felt slightly dizzy. There's no way. That can't be him. Is it? Naruto once again pulled open the curtain to reveal Hiruzen lying in bed. He had a tube going down his throat, a cast for some broken bones, an IV stuck into his veins, and bandages covering nearly his whole body. The old man was hooked up to more machines than Naruto could even count. It turned out that he had sustained a lot more damage than what it first appeared. There were internal lacerations, broken ribs, a punctured lung, and problematic swelling. He was in a stable condition now but Naruto could only imagine the stress on the doctors as they tried to stitch him back up. Naruto took a chair, sat next to the bed and grabbed Hiruzen's hand, the one that wasn't broken. He looked over the state of the man and began to cry. Why did this happen? He wailed. He mulled over the events in his head again and again, thinking of all the little things that he could have done different, things that could have prevented this from happening. The memories he had with Hiruzen began to stream into his mind, all the times he was there when Naruto needed him. His emotions began to fluctuate wildly, from sadness and regret, to happy and reminiscent, then settling on frustrated and vengeful. He sat there for about half an hour, alone with his thoughts. He tried to remember all the good times that he and Hiruzen shared in order to calm himself, but he only succeed in falling deeper into a pit of rage. It was them. Orochimaru and those four, it's their fault. Naruto spat out. He paused. That room with the guard, that's where the girl is. Someone has to pay. Naruto rose from his seat and left, taking one last glance at his Gigi, which only served to spur on his actions further. He exited the room. The door shut behind him as he stepped forward and turned to face Fukuro. Would you come find me when he wakes up? Naruto asked. Sure. Thanks. Naruto turned and began to walk back to the room with the guard. I remember them saying they would treat her wounds, so if she's anywhere, it's in that room, Naruto deduced. He was speed walking down the halls trying his best not to draw attention. He stopped where two hallways intersected and when he reached the corner he went to take a peek. All the way down the hall he could see a single Jonin guard. How do I get past him? Naruto wondered. Naruto toiled over the problem for a minute and then a light bulb went off in his head. A red headed girl shot out from behind the corner and began to frantically run down the hall. She had strange red hair, was covered in bandages, and had a limp. Her eyes were darting around, looking at every door, hoping one of them was an exit. She stumbled along until her eyes locked with those of the guard, she froze in place. The guard stared at her in shock and looked between her and the door he was guarding a couple times. He analyzed the girl and saw that she had a kanai in her hand, how she got it he didn't know. 
I can't let her get away, especially since she's holding a weapon, the guard thought. He suddenly began to give chase and the girl turned and ran back the way she came, always staying a few steps ahead of the Jonin to keep him chasing. As the girl turned left into the intersection hallway, the guard followed. The next second Naruto shot out from the right and ran full speed towards the now unguarded door. He threw the door open and walked in. Man, I really love shadow clones, Naruto mumbled as the door closed. Naruto approached the bed slowly. The girl was sleeping and she had one arm and one leg in a cast. With every step he took his body began to heat up and his rage began to boil. Stopping beside her bed he just stared for a little while, trying to decide what to do. He had come here without really thinking, acting on impulse, but the longer he looked at her the angrier he got. Naruto reached into his holster and gripped a kunai tight enough to turn his knuckles white. With a shaky hand he brought it directly over her heart, and then hesitated. His heart was working double time and he was breathing harder. For an instant, his eyes glanced over at her face and he was shocked to see that she was staring at him. Naruto began to panic. But a raspy voice cut through air. Do it. Naruto gave her an incredulous look. He figured that in the event of this happening, the girl would be begging for her life, apologizing for what she did or try to make some sort of deal. He was so taken aback that his grip on the kanai loosened. He looked into her eyes and he saw himself. He might as well have been looking into a mirror. He could see that endless loneliness that he knew all too well. But the rage was still bubbling inside him, anxious to burst forth and turn the world to ash. Naruto inhaled sharply, raised the kanai higher, then froze again. Naruto looked her in the eye. She was fine with this. Naruto's arm was trembling and he desperately wanted to end her life, to take revenge upon those who harmed his precious people, but in the end he sighed and the kanai fell back to his side. I can't, Naruto whispered. Suddenly heavy footsteps could be heard quickly approaching the door. In his turmoil, Naruto had failed to realize that his clone got poofed during the chase. Naruto did not want to be seen, so he threw himself out of the window. He landed onto the ground hard, luckily it wasn't too high up. Naruto got to his feet and made his escape, still feeling conflicted over what just happened. Naruto had run until he reached the training grounds and he felt like screaming. He felt so conflicted and frustrated that he was ready to lash out at anything. He forcefully yanked down his hood and Seiteki flew out looking for enemies, seeing none, he landed back on the ground. I should have done it. But. Naruto began to scratch his head and mess with his hair in frustration. He decided that this needed to be settled, so he made a familiar hand sign. Shadow Clone Jutsu. Of course a clone popped into existence, but this time it wasn't for battle. Naruto had always found that when he had conflicting feelings about something, it was best solved by having a debate with himself debates that sometimes devolved into senseless fistfights, but it worked most of the time. The clone wasted no time in trying to get his point across. Why didn't you kill her? The clone screamed. You want to kill a girl who was lying helplessly in a hospital bed? Naruto yelled back. Yes. I did, and I still do. So do you. Seiteki watched the exchange with curiosity, cocking his head to the side. That's cold-blooded murder, the original yelled. We're shinobi idiot. Murder is what we do. Look. She hurt someone close to you, for that, she deserves to be hurt back. She came into our home and tried to destroy everything the Hokage have built over the years, she's scum. She was following orders, we could have been in the same position as her. You said it yourself. How can I fault the soldier for following her orders? It's not right. The clone faltered, it appeared Naruto was getting through now. Naruto sighed and said, look, what she did was bad, we both agree on that, but if I were to kill her, what would that make me? You'd be a damn hero. You'd be someone who wanted justice and then went and delivered it. No. My whole life was spent trying to become strong enough so that I could protect people, and not just the people of the leaf, I'd protect anyone who needs my help. So for me to kill her while she's completely helpless would go against who I am, and then I really would be what they say. A demon. The clone sighed but stayed silent, the original had a point. He wanted revenge but to get it he would have to throw away the ideals and morals that made him who he is. Maybe that's why they tell you to dig two graves. So. What? You're just gonna forget about it. While Gigi is suffering in that same hospital? What do you want me to say? I just. I don't know. The clone sucked his teeth, he wasn't so sure if his way was right anymore either. 
there was a long silence with nothing but the sounds of birds filling the air. Did you see that look in her eyes? The original called out suddenly. Yeah, it was like she wanted it, she looked terrified. Yeah. Dot but not of us. Naruto yawned and stretched as he began to exit his bedroom. It had been a few days since his visit to the Hokage and his deserted assassination attempt. In hindsight Naruto was glad he could control himself, but just thinking about it still gave him a strange feeling. There was something else on his mind too. A day after his visit, he had gone back to the hospital in order to see Sasuke, who had just woken up. He was expecting a friendly visit, especially considering the fact that they fought side by side to take down Gara, but he was not so lucky. Naruto opened the door into the hospital room and he noticed that Sakura was already there, tending to Sasuke who was sitting up in bed. He seemed upset about something but Naruto paid it no mind. Hey Sasuke. Finally got enough beauty sleep? The two other occupants in the room turned to look at him and Sasuke seemed amused at his quip. Although, his face quickly returned to its previous upset one. Hey Naruto, Sakura said. She seemed to be acting strangely, more awkward than usual. Naruto greeted her and then turned back to Sasuke. So how you feeling? That Gara guy didn't mess you up too bad right? He asked chuckling. He broke some ribs but other than that I'm fine. Sasuke responded. Oh that's right. Sakura exclaimed. I heard some pretty crazy stuff about you Naruto. Sasuke perked up. You mean those Rumo, Sasuke cut him off. Everyone's talking about how you brought down the monster and saved the Hokage. They're talking about you like a damn hero. Naruto rubbed the back of his head sheepishly. Yeah, I guess they are. Well is it true? Did you save the Hokage after I passed out? Sasuke asked. There was something in his voice that Naruto couldn't discern, he'd never heard Sasuke sound like that before. Naruto responded slowly. Well, yeah, I guess. I was just trying to help the Anbu. Sasuke's reaction could not be seen but he was fuming. When did he get this strong? How could he have kept on going after fighting Gara? If this was the Naruto I used to know, I would have just assumed he was lying, but when we fought together, I could feel it, how much power he truly has. But man, that was crazy wasn't it Sasuke? I didn't think we could actually beat that thing. Naruto. I want to fight you. Now. Naruto and Sakura looked at him dumbfounded. Don't get me wrong I want to fight you too Sasuke but you just woke up, you can't fight yet. Don't be such a wuss. Just fight me and I'll end it quickly. If we fought, you'd need a lot more time in this room. Naruto shot back. No Naruto you can't hurt him, Sakura said. This little comment made Sasuke even angrier. Hurt me? So she's seen his new powers too? Dot and she thinks that he can beat me? He roared in his mind. You won't fight me because you're weak and you know it, Sasuke snarled. Sasuke kun that was uncalled for, Sakura exclaimed. It's not like you're any better. You're even weaker than he is. You shouldn't be a ninja in the first place. Sakura frowned and hung her head sadly, what he said was true which made it hurt even more. What the hell is your problem Teme? Sasuke stepped out of bed and got up in Naruto's face. It's you, he said with disdain. Naruto sighed, he wasn't expecting that. Maybe he and Sasuke will never truly be friends. In the end he refused to fight the Uchiha. As he exited the bedroom he immediately stopped in his tracks as he made eye contact with a familiar mask. There on his couch sat Fukuro with his mask pushed up just enough so that he could shovel some instant ramen into his mouth. From the looks of it he was on his third cup. Yo, Fukuro said with noodles hanging out of his mouth. H how did you get in here? Fukuro stared blankly at him before saying, I'm a member of the Anbu Black Ops, give me some credit. Well then why did you come here? Besides to eat my ramen. You told me to find you when Hokage-sama woke up, so I found you. He's awake. Naruto nearly shouted. Yeah, he woke up two days ago but he had business to discuss. You can go see him now though. Naruto basically teleported throughout his apartment while he got ready to leave. As he reached for the front door a voice stopped him. Hey kid, you think I can take one of these with me? Naruto looked over to see Fukuro holding another cup of instant ramen. He chuckled and said, yeah, sure. He opened the door, then paused. And Fukuro-san? Hum. Thank you, anytime kid. Naruto exited leaving the Anbu standing alone in the apartment.
Fukuro sighed. Man, that kid never catches a break does he? Fukuro looked down to see a blue dragon walking out from seemingly nowhere into view. It stopped and they locked eyes. Suddenly Seiteki began to spark and growl. Fukuro threw his hands up in surrender. Do you want me to leave? Is that it? Seiteki continued to growl. D did I step on a chew toy or something? What is it? What do you want? He asked desperately. Seiteki growled louder and glanced at the cup noodles still in Fukuro's hands. He noticed this and glanced at the cup as well. His eyes kept slowly shifting between the dragon and the cup. Then, in an instant Fukuro sped off towards the window, trying to escape, and Seiteki gave chase. Oh shit, oh shit, oh fuck. Fukuro kept muttering as he ran across rooftops. No matter what he did he couldn't shake Seiteki off his trail. There was a strange screeching sound coming from behind him, so Fukuro took a quick glance back. His eyes widened in shock. Oh shit. A ghhh. Naruto was running through the streets on his way to the hospital, he was excited to see his Gigi. As he was weaving through the crowds he saw something strange. It was a girl with flowing red hair. She was in cuffs and being escorted by some shinobi. She was walking with a limp. Naruto's whole world stopped for a moment as they made eye contact with each other. There were so many little things he could see, so many emotions that were swirling around in her heart. But there was one that ruled over them all, and it was fear. Where are they taking her? What will they do with her? Naruto thought. Time seemed to finally speed up as the girl and the shinobi walked by. Naruto quickly turned around and stopped one of the four shinobi escorting her. The others didn't seem to notice. Excuse me, but. Where exactly are you taking her? The girl? We're taking her to T and I, torture and interrogation. She probably doesn't know anything but I'm sure the boys over there will have fun anyway. The man noticed that he was lagging behind and quickly excused himself. Naruto stood frozen in place. The girl he had just spared was going to be brutally tortured for information she might not even have. He heard the rumors about Konoha's interrogation methods, they were the most effective of all the hidden villages and with good reason. Naruto remembered standing in her hospital room, the way she looked at him. That's why she was so scared, he thought in realization. Naruto continued to walk towards the hospital. He was moving slower than before, it was evident that he had something on his mind. He reached the hospital room before he even knew it. He paused, exhaled slowly and tried to clear his thoughts, then slid the door open. He entered the room to see the sun filtering in through the windows. Hiruzen was in bed, he didn't look much better than the first time, still hooked up to many machines, but he was awake. Naruto walked next to the bed and looked him over for a moment, the sadness plastered clearly across his face for Hiruzen to see. Naruto, Hiruzen said in a raspy voice. You came to see me, I'm glad. It seemed like he was trying to hide it but Naruto could hear it in his voice, he was in pain. Naruto began to tear up, something the cage took notice of. I'm not long for this world Naruto-kun. Naruto jerked up as the old cage confirmed his suspicions, this was his deathbed. Hiruzen continued to speak. But don't cry for me, your fire burns Bert and I know that you will make a fine man and a great Hokage. Naruto burst into tears and collapsed, burying his face into the bed, beside the dying man. I should have have stopped this, I could have done more, I should have. Naruto mumbled into the bed sheets. I know what you did that day Naruto-kun, and as a shinobi of the leaf village, I couldn't have asked for more. I'm proud of you. Naruto didn't raise his head off of the bed but the tears lessened ever so slightly. Gigi. It's not fair. Why do you have to die while that girl gets to live? It's her fault. I should have killed her, but I couldn't. Hiruzen quickly pieced together what Naruto was saying. His body was failing but his mind was still sharp. Well. Dot why do you think that is? Naruto stayed silent. I know why. It's because you know what many others fail to understand. The weak seek out vengeance, but the strong find it in their hearts to forgive those who are worthy and live on. You saw a light in that girl didn't you? Something that made her worthy of your forgiveness. Don't mistaken that for weakness or cowardice, you are strong Naruto. He went into a coughing fit as he finished his small lecture. There was a rattling sound coming from his lungs and it was getting harder for him to breathe. Naruto looked on with worry but after a minute Hiruzen caught his breath before speaking again. He wasn't finished with his life lesson, after all. The life of a shinobi is full of conflicts and violence, these things chip away at the body. 
Please Maruto, don't let this resentment chip away at your mind. The young ninja let the wise words of his elder tumble around in his mind. Forgiveness is for the strong, don't let this chip away at your mind. You are strong Maruto. You saw something in her, didn't you? He paused. What did I see in her? What made me stop? An image of her face came to the forefront of his mind. Eyes full of fear and loneliness, a frown full of sorrow, a tear formed from regrets. Okay. Naruto said. I'll try. The wise cage smiled and placed his hand atop Naruto's head to comfort him. His hand was warm despite the fact that his time was running out. Naruto held back tears as he realized this would likely be the last time he felt this warmth. Naruto-kun, I have one final surprise for you. Naruto sniffled. What is it? He asked. I spoke to Jiraiya yesterday and he agreed to make you his apprentice. Two days from now you will be going on a journey with him to find the next Hokage. He will train you to be a great shinobi, I'm sure of it. Suddenly the door opened revealing a nurse who entered and then spoke up. I'm sorry, but I need to perform a checkup on Hokage-sama, would you please exit the room? But. Naruto shifted his gaze from the nurse back to Hiruzen who gave him a weak but encouraging smile. Naruto dropped his shoulders. Okay. He got up and began to exit the room, taking one last look at the first person to ever care for him, he shut the door behind himself and began to walk away. I'm gonna make you proud Gigi. I promise, there was a feeling of determination welling up inside the young man. This was not a promise that could be easily broken. Two days had passed and Jiraiya was almost ready to depart. He had gathered all the necessary supplies and funds but there was one more thing he needed to do before they left. He told Naruto to wait for him by the gates, hopefully it doesn't cause too much trouble. Naruto was sat down by the village gates waiting for Jiraiya to return. He had packed for the trip as well, carrying many of the same things as Jiraiya. In truth, Naruto didn't really want to leave, he wanted to be here when Hiruzen passed. But this is what Gigi wanted for me. So. Seiteki was sleeping underneath Naruto's blue hood once again. He could hear the small dragon's rhythmic breathing. He sometimes wondered what dragons dreamed about or if they dreamed at all. Naruto snapped back to reality when he caught sight of something red in his peripherals and as he turned to view it fully, he stood up in alarm. He could see Jiraiya walking towards him but that wasn't the problem. The problem was the redhead following behind him. Naruto stared at the Sanin in disbelief, and as Jiraiya reached the gates Naruto made his discontent very apparent. Why did you bring her here? Jiraiya sighed and said. T and I couldn't get anything out of her so they asked me to give it a shot since I taught them what they know in the first place. What do you mean give it a shot? Are you gonna take her with us? Naruto asked. Yeah, if she knows something about Orochimaru or his hideouts, anything that can help, I'm getting it out of her. The girl moved ever so slightly, Naruto couldn't tell but it looked like she flinched. Well I'm not going anywhere with her. Naruto, you want to get stronger so you can protect those you care about, right? Naruto nodded slowly. You know I can help you with that. I won't force you to go, but I want you to think of your precious people, think of what they would want for you and of what you want for them. Naruto thought for a long while. He thought of everyone he wanted to protect and if it was possible to do that without Jiraiya. He didn't want to go, especially now that she was coming along too. In the end he sighed and lowered his head, accepting the fact that he needed Jiraiya's help to become stronger. Fine. I'm glad you saw sense Naruto, besides, I don't think she'll be causing any trouble, Jiraiya said. Naruto took a close look at her for the first time that day and he noticed something strange. He couldn't see anything in her eyes, not like before. When he looked now they just seemed dead, empty. What did they do to her? Naruto wondered. Jiraiya turned to her now, snapping his fingers to get her attention. She looked at him, her motions seemed autonomous, hardly alive. Jiraiya held up a piece of paper that had a seal on it. Naruto also noticed a slightly similar looking seal on the back of his hand. Then he began to speak. I've placed a copy of this seal on you and I'm going to explain what it does, so listen carefully. Firstly, this seal suppresses your chakra, so don't try using it. Second, it will notify me if you move further than 20 feet away by making this seal on my hand glow. Lastly, if you remain further than 20 feet away from me for longer than one hour, a paralytic toxin will be released into your bloodstream that will slowly cause your lungs and heart to stop. I can also activate the seal and release the full dose at will so don't get any bright ideas. 
Jiraiya seemed pleased with his explanation and after making sure she understood, he was ready to set off on their journey. Naruto looked at her as Jiraiya began to walk off, beckoning them to follow. Naruto almost felt bad for her, she just survived whatever they were doing to her in T and I and now she was a prisoner all over again. He took his eyes off her and began to follow the toad sage. I guess that's just what happens to enemy shinobi, it can't be helped. They had departed the leaf village in the morning and had been walking until it was almost dark out, only stopping for a quick lunch break. A break in which the prisoner was denied food. She was only given water, just enough to keep her moving. It truly seemed like she didn't have energy for anything else. As a matter of fact, she hadn't said a word the whole day. They came to a stop in a clearing with a river close by. Jiraiya turned and spoke up. This is where we'll spend the night, got room for dinner Naruto. You bet I do. Naruto responded enthusiastically. Good. I need you to set up the tents for me while I prepare the food. Jiraiya took two rolled up tents and threw them to Naruto. There are only two so you'll share yours with the girl. Naruto looked at him incredulously. Jiraiya began to laugh and held up a thrid tent. Just kidding, he joked. Naruto scowled and moved to put up the tents. Well I thought it was funny, Jiraiya mumbled. Some time passed and Naruto finished setting up the tents. They formed a sort of isosceles triangle, and Shuda paid attention in geometry, with the cooking equipment in the middle. Speaking of which, the food was giving off an enticing aroma which made Naruto's stomach growl and his mouth water. Jiraiya and the girl were sat by the small fire sitting opposite each other and Naruto went to join them. They all waited, with nothing but the crackling of the fire filling the silent night. Aft what seemed like forever Jiraiya finally pulled out two bowls, one for him and one for Naruto. He dipped a ladle into the pot and slowly poured it into a bowl before handing it to Naruto. He did the same motion with his own bowl, emptying the cooking pot. It was almost like he was making sure the prisoner could see every atom of food that went into that bowl. Without hesitation Jiraiya began to dig in but Naruto looked at the redhead, she had gotten no food, again. Oh! Jiraiya exclaimed. I almost forgot, here. He threw something at her, she made no motion to catch it, so it struck her chin and landed in her lap. It was some sort of granola bar. Jiraiya resumed eating, his food was disappearing at an alarming rate. Your food's gonna get cold Naruto, he said between bites. Eat it. It wasn't a suggestion. Naruto slowly began to eat, filling his belly with the warm meal he had been craving all day. It only took a minute for the toad sage to empty his bowl. Standing up he said, well, guess I'll turn in for the night. He retreated into his tent, claiming the one at the triangle's tip. The red head followed suit, entering her tent, leaving Naruto alone with a half-empty bowl of food. He stared down into the bowl guiltily. There was something strange happening, his mind was quiet, like still water. There were no thoughts to guide his actions, instead, his subconscious was taking control. To put it simply, he'd witnessed injustice and his subconscious wanted to set it right. He looked at Jiraiya's tent, then at the prisoner's tent, then back to the food. He stood up and slowly walked to the front of the girl's tent. He still wasn't truly thinking about his actions. About how what he was doing directly undermined Jiraiya interrogation methods. About how he was going to show kindness to someone who participated in besieging his home, someone who aided in the attempted assassination of his most precious person. He entered the tent and was surprised to see her sitting in one spot, staring at nothing. She had opened the granola bar but only ate a piece, likely rationing the rest. He stepped further into the tent but she did not look up at him, so he lowered himself to look her in the eye. Slowly, he held the bowl out to her, half full of still warm food. For the first time that day, she actually came alive. She seemed conscious, aware of her surroundings. Slowly, she reached for the bowl of food, wary of Naruto. She grabbed hold of it and stared at its contents, wondering if the boy in front of her had done something to it, her stomach was so empty she almost didn't care. I'm only giving you this because it isn't fair for him to starve you. She couldn't resist anymore, the food's aroma was filling her nostrils, making her even hungrier than before. She began to devour Naruto's little gift and within seconds that bowl was clean. Having set the injustice right, his subconscious receded, he now realized the full scope of what he just did, but why did he do it? His moral compass, his sense of right and wrong, had a big part to play, but not the biggest. As his thoughts flooded back in, so too came Hiruzen's last words of wisdom, running through his head. 
Don't let this chip away at your mind. I'm gonna try. But just this once, he thought. What's your name? Naruto asked, cutting through the silence. She didn't answer. She simply stared down and shrunk into herself, avoiding eye contact and Naruto's confrontational aura. I know you can speak. Still no response. Naruto stared at the ground sadly for a moment. I'm sorry Gigi. Naruto mumbled quietly. He got up and turned to leave the tent. To Yuya. She blurted out. Naruto looked back at her to see that she was gripping the empty bowl tightly, and there, looking into her eyes, he could see the reason he entered the tent in the first place. Hiruzen's words called out once more. You saw a light in her, didn't you? His eyes widened but he composed himself. For a moment time froze, as if the universe itself was trying to decide what the future held for these two shinobi. To Yuya. Naruto repeated softly. Suddenly Naruto felt a warmth, the same warmth he had felt with Hiruzen in the hospital room. Even when the man was miles away, it was like he was still trying to encourage Naruto, to lead him down the right path. Why don't we? Talk more tomorrow, okay to Yuya. She nodded slowly and after a moment Naruto left the tent, leaving to Yuya to stare at the empty bowl contently. Jiraiya watched from a tree branch as Naruto exited to Yuya's tent and walked into his own, without his bowl of food. I didn't think the kid would actually do it, he mumbled to himself. Jiraiya was planning on interrogating to Yuya in a day or so, when she was hungry, tired and delirious, but now that wasn't possible. Jiraiya wasn't upset however, as he was good at improvising. If they begin to trust each other, then she might tell Naruto something useful. It'll be better if I pretend I don't know they're talking, Jiraiya thought. He decided that he'd always cook a little bit extra so that Naruto can still eat his share and have some leftover. Jiraiya leapt off the branch and entered his tent, he suspected the next day would prove to be interesting. There was a rustling sound coming from the entrance to the tent, it had been left partially open to let some of the cool air in. As the rustling continued, a scaly blue snout poked through the opening. It sniffed the air for a moment and then pushed the rest of its head through. The mystical yellow eyes of the young dragon met the beautiful chocolate browns of Tiyuya. They stared, analyzing each other. What the fuck am I looking at? Tiyuya thought to herself. Slowly, Seiteki lifted one leg and placed it inside the tent, maintaining eye contact as he did so testing the waters so to speak. Tiyuya tried not to react. He decided to push on and soon his other limbs followed until he entered the tent completely. Tiyuya didn't know if she should try to scare this thing off. It didn't seem too dangerous. Seiteki began to walk closer, cautiously. It's kinda cute. Tiyuya thought as the small beast approached her. She was a bit worried though. This seemed to be some kind of baby animal and if the mother was nearby, it probably wouldn't end well. Seiteki finally reached her and began to sniff around, inspecting her. Tiyuya on the other hand, stayed as still as possible, not wanting to scare or aggravate him. It took a minute, but Seiteki stopped sniffing her and was now rubbing his face on her hand while letting out a low rumbling sound. Tiyuya blinked in surprise. She did not expect this, but as adorable as Seiteki was she couldn't resist. She slowly began to pet the dragon's head, amazed at how smooth his rough-looking scales felt. To her dismay, a couple of Seiteki's scales fell off as she passed her hand over them. It didn't seem to cause him any pain or discomfort, and it looked like there were new ones growing underneath. The newer scales looked shinier, more metallic. Seiteki was enjoying the attention and to display that, small arcs of electricity jumped from the spines on his back. To Yuya's eyes filled with awe, amazed by this adorable, but also dangerous, creature. As she continued to shower Seiteki with affection, she took in his strange yet familiar features. Then she had a thought. There's no way. Naruto yawned and stretched as he woke from his slumber. Sitting up and rubbing his eyes, he looked around the tent and instantly got the feeling something was missing. He got up onto his feet, clad in only his boxers, and came to the swift realization that Seiteki was nowhere to be seen. He walked to where he had laid down his blue hoodie the night before, if Seiteki was still sleeping, he would be under there. Naruto gently lifted the hoodie and found nothing. He was beginning to worry a bit. Quickly dressing himself, Naruto stepped out of the tent and tipped his head up toward the sky, searching for anything with wings. The sky was clear of birds, and of Seiteki. Panic was setting in, but then he saw something strange. He could see something blue laying in the grass, and he bent down to look at it. It was one of Seiteki's scales. 
there were more just a few feet away. And they were leading towards Tuyuya's tent. The entrance to the tent burst open and Naruto entered wild eyed. He set his eyes on Tuyuya and could see her holding Seiteki in her arms. Why did you take Seiteki? Let him go, he yelled as he drew a kanai. Tuyuya looked puzzled and a little fearful. I didn't do anything, she proclaimed. He held up something blue for her to see. You ripped off his scales, you sick bitch, he said with venom. It was at this moment Seiteki decided to intervene. He wriggled his way out of Tuyuya's comfortable grasp and stood in front of her, facing Naruto. He lowered his body into attack position and bared his fangs to his summoner, as electricity crackled around him. Seiteki! What are you doing? he asked in shock. Naruto looked closer at the hostile dragon, and as he did so, his confusion grew to new heights. There wasn't a single scale missing from his body, in fact, he looked healthier than ever. He lowered the kanai slightly and Seiteki rose from his threatening stance, the crackle of electricity could no longer be heard as Seiteki now stuck out his tongue playfully. Naruto holstered the kanai completely and kneeled down to pet his halfway loyal summon. As he did so, he noticed the scales that were still falling off, and the new smoother, harder, shinier scales underneath. So she didn't hurt him? Naruto thought. Then why did she take him in the first place? He eyed the girl with suspicion. Seiteki was struggling against him, he just wouldn't stay still. Naruto sighed and let go of the small dragon. Seiteki then dashed back to Tuyuya and once again began to rub his face on her soft hands. He let out a purring sound and his tail was swaying side to side. Did he come here on his own? Naruto wondered. Tuyuya made no move to pet the animal, as much as she wanted to, instead she looked up at the blonde boy who was sat off to her right. He noticed her gaze and recognized it as a request for permission. The young ninja quickly darted his eyes between her and his little friend, he paused for a moment, and then made a gesture with his arms that said, go ahead. Tuyuya didn't need to be told twice and immediately began to shower Seiteki with attention, which he was obviously loving. Much of her attention was focused on Seiteki but that didn't mean she wasn't wary of the blonde. He showed her kindness last night when he gave her something to eat, but, what did he want? Her mind was racing through every possibility and trying to answer a single question. Can I trust him? What if he poisons my food? What if he just wants info? Can he help me? What if this is all a trick? Questions piled up in her mind, and as every second passed, her desire to escape increased exponentially. He likes it when you scratch his chin, the boy said quietly. Tuyuya was shaken from her thoughts and she looked up at the boy. In the few times their eyes had met before, this was the first time she truly looked into his. His were different than any she had seen before. As opposed to the predatory gaze of Orochimaru, the scornful looks of her fellow Sound 4, or the suspicious glances of her captor Jiraiya, Naruto showed nothing she could read. There was no hatred or malice, no hidden intent, in this moment they were simply strangers, bonding over a pet dragon. She scoffed at the thought, she had heard of the legendary summons during her time under Orochimaru, but who thought she would ever see one? Nevertheless she brought her delicate hands to the underside of Seiteki's chin. The reaction was instant as Seiteki closed his eyes in bliss and raised his head to give Tuyuya more access. Watch out for the tail. Naruto warned. Right on cue, the tip of Seiteki's tail lit up and small arcs of electricity began dissipating into the air. It looked like a plasma globe would, but without the glass. Tuyuya gawked at the mesmerizing display as she continued scratching the young dragon's chin. The longer this went on, the stronger the arcs seemed to get. All right, you should probably stop now, Naruto said with an amused smile. In her dazzled state, she didn't quite understand what he said and by the time he repeated himself, it was too late. The arcs had disappeared, instead, the tip of Seideki's tail glowed with dangerous intensity. Naruto rushed to her side and placed his hand right next to Seideki's tail, making sure to have his feet planted firmly on the ground. Tuyuya recoiled as an arc of electricity more powerful than any she'd seen, jumped the gap between Seideki's tail and Naruto's hand, crackling as it turned the air to plasma. Naruto grunted as he felt the current course through him and channel out through his feet into the ground. Naruto then turned to Tuyuya. You need to be more careful, he said annoyed. Tuyuya could see that his arm was trembling. She also noticed something else. Naruto seemed to have some sort of metal lining in his sandals. Lining that was clearly used to lessen the damage his body took from incidents just like this one. 
she took a glance at his still trembling arm and at his face that was wincing in pain. If he hadn't gotten to me on time, she thought. Seiteki quickly hopped up onto Naruto's shoulder and frantically began to paw at his face, showing his concern. Naruto gave him a dirty look which caused Seiteki to lower his head. And I thought I told you to control yourself, he said accusingly. Just then, a voice called from outside the tents. Naruto. It was Jiraiya. Naruto looked at Tuyuya with panic, and seeing Naruto panic caused Tuyuya to panic too. He can't know that I'm here, Naruto thought. What happens to me if he sees Naruto? Tuyuya mentally roared. How am I gonna get out of here without him seeing me? Naruto questioned. Tuyuya suddenly had a bright idea. She rushed over to Naruto and shoved her hand into his pouch. Naruto grabbed a hold of her wrist and gripped it tightly, wary of what she was attempting to do. I need a kanai, she said. Why, do I really threaten you? she asked. Naruto scowled, but released her wrist. She dug around in the pouch for a couple seconds before fetching a kanai and then walking to the back of the tent. You know you could have just taken the one in my holster, right? Naruto asked amused. Tuyuya quickly glanced over to see the easily accessible kanai. Of course I knew that. Shut up. Jiraiya called out once again. Naruto. I'm trying to make you a great ninja like me, get out here. Tuyuya knelt down at the back of the tent and cut a flap just big enough for a small animal. Okay, now we can send the little cutie out there to distract him. Cutie? Guess she has a soft spot for animals, Naruto noted. He took Seiteki off his shoulder and set him down in front of the opening. Already knowing what to do, Seiteki took off. Now they just had to wait. Naruto went to the front of the tent to get a peek outside, Tuyuya knelt down next to him to do the same. Jiraiya was standing out in front of Naruto's tent calling his name to no response. Though, he knew the reason why. He hoped that Naruto and Tuyuya would work together in order to avoid being detected, thus building trust between them and hopefully leading to Tuyuya leaking information. Just then, he caught a glimpse of blonde and red hair peeking through the tent flap. Guess my plan is working then. Jiraiya marked. Naruto, he yelled out again. We're training today. Wake up. He heard something hit the ground softly behind him and turned to find out what it was. As he looked down he saw Seiteki staring at him. Seiteki? I figured he would be with Naruto. Oh well, guess I got to keep up the act. Hey Seiteki, think you can help me find Naruto? Seiteki continued to stare without moving. Jiraiya furrowed his brow slightly. Don't tell me he mumbled. Suddenly Seiteki began running full speed toward the toad sage, he covered half the distance before leaping off the ground and latching onto Jiraiya's face. Jiraiya flailed about as he tried to pry Seiteki off. Why? He shouted in despair. Now's my chance, Naruto exclaimed as he got ready to bolt from the tent. Wait! Tuyuya shouted. Naruto snapped his head toward her. What? I gotta go, he said in a panicked manner. Tuyuya was going to hate doing this but she didn't really have a choice. She crawled over to where she had hidden something. Hesitantly, she moved back to Naruto, still on her knees, and held out a bowl. Naruto blinked in realization. It was the bowl of food he gave her last night, now empty of course. He shifted his gaze to her face to see that she was looking away. In shame? Please. She said quietly. Naruto looked out of the tent to see Jiraiya still blinded by Seiteki, before looking back to her. After a moment's pause, he smiled broadly and placed his hand on the bowl, getting her attention. Well, it's the least I can do for my partner in crime. With that said, he took the bowl from her hands and left to sneak into his own tent. Partners in crime. Tuyuya repeated. Seeing that Naruto had made it safely into his own tent, Seiteki released Jiraiya from his torment. As he landed back on the ground, Jiraiya looked at him with murder in his eyes, it was a promise of revenge. After a moment, Naruto stepped out of his tent stretching and yawning, trying his best to make believe he had only just awoken. What's all the yelling for? He asked in a sleepy voice. I've been calling you for 20 minutes, Jiraiya yelled. Oh stop exaggerating pervy sage, he responded nonchalantly. Something hard then smacked him in the face and as he looked he could see a small pan lying on the ground. Why do you throw that at me ya old perv? If you want me to train you then you're gonna have to start doing what I say, when I say it. Now. Jiraiya continued, 
if you want to be an amazing shinobi like me. Naruto scoffed mockingly and immediately had to dodge another item. Then you'll need to train with your summons. But I already trained with Seiteki, can't you teach me some new jutsu? Naruto whined. There is always more to learn when it comes to summons. Jiraiya glanced at Seiteki. I doubt that sentence has ever been more true, he thought. Before Naruto could complain more, he said, you need to tell this little beast over here to go back to the throat of the world and ask for a reverse summon. Seiteki bit Jiraiya's leg in response to his little quip causing him to flinch slightly. Reverse summon. Naruto repeated, confused. Yes. A reverse summon is when you are brought to the summons location instead of them to yours. I suspect it's what happened on your first attempt. Naruto thought about it for a moment. If he wanted to get stronger then training with the dragons seemed like the best course of action. Okay. I'm ready now, he said excited. Seiteki nodded and poofed away, with Naruto following seconds after. As the smoke began to dissipate, Jiraiya let out a small sigh and then glanced over to the prisoner's tent. Tuyuya fell back from the opening she was peeking through. Jiraiya was walking to her tent. Naruto appeared in a strange but familiar place. The air was cold and thin and there were nothing but trees to be seen. He was, of course, at the throat of the world, but no matter how many times he came here he was sure it would always feel foreign. Strangely he began to sense things he hadn't during his first visit. The vitality of this place was astronomical, everything seemed to radiate energy, all the way down to the blades of grass. The closer he looked at this place, the more he could see. How could he have missed all of this? There were dragons everywhere, hiding amongst the trees or scurrying across the ground, but strangely they all seemed to be youngsters. Naruto looked on in bewilderment as he witnessed one dragon feasting on the corpse of another. Whoa! Survival of the fittest I guess. Sadly. His time to admire this place was cut short as he could hear the wing beat of a dragon. Touching down in front of him, Naruto was happy to see Chishiki. I am glad to see you, I am in need of your assistance. You need my help? For what? Naruto asked. Perhaps it is better if I show you. Naruto nodded and hopped onto Chishiki's back and prepared to take flight. Chishiki flapped his wings and the leaves shook with each gust. This'll never get old. Naruto thought happily. He loved the feeling of the wind blowing past him and he was enjoying the silent, scenic ride but there was something he needed to ask. Hey Chishiki. Yes. I saw something. Weird back there. Ah. I see. What you witnessed was the early stages of the dragon life cycle. When a dragon is born, they cannot think and are driven purely by instinct. They are drawn to the forest and as a result, must survive there until they obtain higher thought. But. You guys are cannibals. Only if need be. There are other things to eat there. So. What happens after they obtain higher thought? Chishiki flew through a cloud causing Naruto to come out slightly damp. At that stage, they will begin to seek out others of like mind. Essentially, they are assimilated back into our society, thus completing the cycle. Naruto was strangely fascinated by all this knowledge and there seemed to be an infinite amount of things to ask and learn about, but a burning question came to the forefront. What about Seiteki? He looks younger than some of the dragons I saw back there. The young one? He is the exception, because he is your familiar. Familiar. Familiar is what we call a dragon who is no longer drawn to the forest and will never return. When you summoned him, you tore him from the cycle. As a result, he will stay with you. He will grow in power, but not in size or mentality. Though he may pick up some human quirks. So summoning him made him my familiar? Does that mean you're my familiar too? No only adolescent dragons can become familiars, as they develop a strong bond with the summoner. Sometimes it is so strong that the pair is able to share thoughts and feelings, but that is rare. Then Naruto had a devious thought. So if I summon a bunch of baby dragons, I could have an army of familiars. Chishiki laughed loudly. Good luck with that. Baby dragons are notoriously territorial and will fight to the death. Naruto imagined for a moment, 100 tiny dragons, all hissing and growling at each other, setting things ablaze and just in general causing mayhem. Babies are kinda scary, you can say that again. They were beginning to land in a nearby clearing. Naruto could see some familiar faces, or rather, snouts, scales. Anyway, he could see Chikara laying on the ground with Jakuna nearby. He could even see Seiteki atop Chikara's head, jumping up and down, trying to get his attention. This is what I need you for. 
Chishiki said as he touched down. Naruto looked at Chikara and was beginning to understand. His intimidating aura was gone and he was just lying there, like he was trying to melt into the ground. It was weird to see such a proud dragon looking so small. Naruto jumped down and rushed over. What's wrong with him? he asked. We aren't sure, said Jakuna. He's been this way since we fought Shukaku. Naruto stared at Chikara in thought, analyzing him. As he did so, Seiteki excitedly rushed over to him and once again nestled in his hair. Undisturbed by Seiteki's antics, Naruto continued to analyze the red giant. Even though they were of two completely different species, Naruto could easily identify the problem. He was all too familiar with the emotions Chikara was feeling, some would call him an expert. I guess no one's immune to it. He felt certain that he knew the cause of this, but wanted to be sure, so he simply asked. Are you upset that I sent you back? There was a low rumble from him in response. I did it to protect you, I know, Chikara responded. Then why are you upset? Because you had to protect me. I should not need your protection nor should I have lost to that stupid Tanuki. Wounded pride isn't too hard to fix. I'll get you back to your old self. Naruto thought happily. But you did. Naruto said matter of factly. What? Chikara growled out. You did lose. And you did need my help, so maybe you're weaker than you thought. Chikara stood up and glared down at Naruto, flames billowing out from his mouth. He's going to get himself killed, Chishiki muttered. You would dare insult me? If you were anything like the Chikara I first met then no, but you? Definitely. Chikara's body exploded into flames, scorching the ground beneath him and distorting the air around him. Teeth or fire? Choose your death. Or, we could test your strength, and maybe, you can prove me wrong. Do you wish to test me? How? Chikara asked annoyed. I'm bound to get into a fight sooner or later, Naruto said, shrugging. I bet that in our next fight you'll still lose, he said, pointing a finger. Chikara lowered his head so that he could look at Naruto eye to eye. The heat radiating from him was painful but Naruto did not back away. He was afraid he would lose his eyebrows but he wasn't about to back down. I will show you the meaning of strength. Do not keep me waiting. The flames surrounding him died down and he took off without another word. As he disappeared into the clouds Chishiki spoke. I figured you could help but. How did you know exactly what to say? He's stubborn, like me, and if there's one thing stubborn people love to do, it's prove other people wrong. Where do you think he's going? Jakuna asked. I am unsure. But wherever it is, I'm certain he will return stronger than before. Chishiki responded. Suddenly, the sounds of the forest stopped. The next second, each dragon perked their heads up and looked in the same direction. It was freaking Naruto out. What caught all of their attention? He wondered. He looked to where they were staring, but saw nothing. The only thing worthy of note was that Mundana's cave was in that direction. They were released from their strange trance-like state and Chishiki turned to him. Akai Shi would like to see you. No way. Naruto said in awe. You guys can talk with your minds? Naruto deduced. Not exactly. Akai Shi is the only one able to speak, we just listen. Jakuna answered. It is best if you depart soon. Chishiki said. Wait, what does he want to see me for? He did not say. You should go find out. Chishiki stated. Naruto nodded and took off towards Mundana's cave. He had reached the cave's entrance. Once again his eyes were drawn to the great big piles of white bones strewn about the ground. He would probably never get used to that. He took a step forward, the bones rattling against each other as he did so, alerting Mundana to his presence. A shadow dropped down in front of him and began to unfurl into the form of a dragon. Mundana looked the boy in his eyes. You finally arrived. Pleasure to see you again. Although he was addressed in a friendly manner, Naruto was no less intimidated than the first time they'd met. As opposed to the three brothers, who exuded a powerful yet regal aura, Mundana's was chaotic. Naruto had a feeling that summoning him would embed fear into enemies and allies alike. Will you take me to the boss? Of course, come with me. Mundana led him further into the caves, not making a sound as he stepped over his collection of calcium. A shiver went down Naruto's spine. Mundana was definitely the scariest by far. The pair had reached Akai Shi's lava pool. He was, of course, resting within it and he opened his eyes as they approached. Naruto had a sudden thought. 
I wonder if that's like a hot tub for him. Maybe he gets wrinkles, he thought, chuckling. Thing I wish to show you. Naruto stared blankly for a moment before his body filled with panic. Shit. He was talking. I, I wasn't even listening. Oh god oh god what did he say? Me, Akai Shi finished. I did it again. Naruto was having a mini heart attack, but that feeling was quickly replaced with awe as Akai Shi began to slowly rise up from the lava to his full height. The molten rock was cascading down the smooth surface of the Dragon King's body before splashing back down into the pool. Wait. Naruto thought. Smooth? He looked closely at Akai Shi and indeed he was completely smooth, not a scale to be seen. How strange. Akai Shi began to delve deeper into the caves, each of his steps causing the ground to quake. Mundana, having completed his task, began to make his way back. With both dragons moving in opposite directions, Naruto wasn't sure what to do, he felt like a kid whose mother left them in the cashier line. He really should have been paying attention. I am waiting for you child. Akai Shi's voice rang out. He was already out of sight but his voice boomed through the cavern. Got it. Naruto said, finally realizing what he needed to do. He ran after Akai Shi, hoping he didn't notice Naruto's daydreaming. Akai Shi and Naruto entered an enchanting new place, one that amazed Naruto with its beauty, but more importantly, oozed power in colossal quantities. This place was, for lack of a better term, a mindfuck. Naruto knew that they were underground and yet he could look up and see the sunlight piercing through the trees. Where the sun bathed the ground, moss, grass and even small trees grew, and in the areas where leaves or rocky overhangs blocked its grace, bioluminescent plants thrived, adding to the mystical sight. From the surface, through the large roots of the ancient trees, a river flowed down into the grove. It had clearly been flowing for a long time, as it cut out a circular path that left an island in its center. The island was partly bathed in sunlight and partly shrouded in shade, a perfect balance of both. Seiteki also seemed amazed by the sight of Kobayashi Island, so much so that he left the warm fluffy sanctum of Naruto's hoodie to explore. He seemed particularly interested in a warm rock sitting in the sun. This is Kobayashi Island, a sacred place for dragonkind. As you can tell, this is where we go to shed our scales. Akai Shi explained. Naruto could see scales everywhere, glittering in the sunlight. He peeled his eyes away from the gorgeous place and turned to the boss summon, he was about to speak but was baffled by what he saw. There was a chill flowing off Akai Shi, and the cause? His scales. What just? I thought you didn't have scales, Naruto proclaimed. Akai Shi laughed. I always dreamed of seeing a human's reaction to that. How did you do that? He asked, admiring his icy scales. Literally. The scales were made of crystal clear ice. I did nothing. My scales grow uncontrollably against my will. If I were to allow it, they would grow so much that I would be immobilized. It is the reason I so often reside in the lava pool. So you mean that the lava melts your scales? Precisely. In fact, it is the only thing hot enough to melt them. Although, it is not a pleasurable experience. I would liken it to staying in a hot bath for too long. I knew it. Naruto thought. But enough about me. Can you feel it? The power this place holds? Hard not to, it's even more suffocating than yours. What is it? The scales. They each radiate a portion of the dragon's power which can be absorbed, and with so many of them. Well, surely you see the potential. Do you wish to harness it? Naruto nodded enthusiastically, excited at the prospect of being a step closer to his dream. He made his way over to the island and with every step he could sense more and more of its accumulated power. He stood in front of some large rocks and turned back to Akai Shi for instruction. You only need to sit still and let the power flow through you, but there are two things you must be wary of. Naruto nodded, ready to learn and making sure he actually heard what Akai Shi was saying this time. If too much draconic chakra flows into you, your body will be supercharged with power but it will also begin to burn, inside and out. If this happens, you must jump into the waters as soon as possible. What's the other thing? In the event that you take too little chakra, it will run rampant in your system if not expelled, and could permanently damage your chakra coils or worse. So then, if I have to choose, is it better to take more or less chakra? If you wish to continue being a ninja, I suggest taking more. Naruto was a bit shaken by the dangers of using this power but decided that it was worth the risk. He still wasn't exactly sure what would happen once it entered his body, 
but if it was coming from the dragons it must be worth it. Naruto sat upon a rock, closed his eyes, and began to focus. He could feel the chakra flowing all around him, permeating the air. As he relaxed, the chakra began to seep into him, flowing through his coils. It reminded him of when the Nine Tails chakra would leak out, except without all the negative emotions that came with it, just the power. It was intoxicating. More and more of this powerful chakra began to flow through him and as it did so, he could sense everything around him, it was almost like he could see without his eyes, like a sixth sense. Naruto was eager to find out what else this chakra could do and continued to let it flow into him. He could feel his muscles swell with strength, his ears could pick up sounds from much further away, he could even smell the blooming flowers on the surface. Then there was a tingling sensation, coming from deep within him, he wasn't sure what it was but it was growing in intensity. The feeling seemed to explode suddenly and he opened his eyes to see his body covered in blue flames. The searing pain was all over his body and he screamed as he ran towards the river. The water sizzled as he jumped in. He could hear Akai Shi laughing as he pulled himself out of the water but ignored it. He was singed all over but as he lifted his now ruined shirt he could see a small area of skin around his stomach had burned off, leaving the pink flesh to be seen underneath. Holy crap! I was only on fire for like three seconds, no way I'm doing that again, he ranted. He stood there staring at the wound and prodding at it lightly. The blue flames weren't making any sense to him, his whole body caught fire but only his stomach had taken serious damage. It was like some parts of the flames started cold and then got hotter with time. If he took too long to get to the river then he was a goner. Giving up so quickly child? Akai Shi asked. He steeled himself and walked back to the rock taking a seat once again. He put his hands together and focused, letting the chakra flow into him. Once again he felt the power, the heightened senses, the feeling he could do anything. Then he felt that same tingle from before, hardly long enough for him to even register its presence. Once again he could feel the chakra explode but this time he stopped absorbing it as soon as he felt it burst. His eyes shot open as he felt that searing pain but he wasn't covered in flames. The pain was coming from within and it was rising, from his stomach to his chest and finally to his throat. He dropped to his knees as blue flames began to uncontrollably spout from his mouth. He held his throat in pain and continued to projectile vomit fire. His eyes were tearing up by the time he dunked his head into the river. Naruto fell to his side still clenching his throat and stayed there unmoving. Do you wish to continue? You don't have to. Naruto tried to respond but all that came out was a raspy moan. Instead he pulled himself together, stood up, and dragged himself back to the rock. He sat upon it and focused. Akai Shi watched the boy as he endured the pain and sat upon the rock. His determination is admirable, though I wonder how long he can hold out before he gives in. Naruto's right arm suddenly burst into flames, all the way up to the elbow, but Naruto didn't move. Akai Shi could see that he shut his eyes tighter, either from the pain or to try and focus. The Dragon King didn't want Naruto to suffer permanent damage so he splashed the river water onto him extinguishing the flames. Naruto spoke in a pained, raspy voice. Thanks, Akai Shi looked at him in slight surprise, it was only for a moment before the flames were extinguished, but it seemed like Naruto was able to smother them somehow. Perhaps a better question is how long until he masters this. Naruto sat still and closed his eyes once more. Akai Shi had continued to watch Naruto as he attempted this over and over, it had been so long that the rock he sat upon was scorched black. Akai Shi was beginning to tire and his scales were getting way out of hand, he would need help moving now. Night had fallen for what he believed to be the second time, in the absence of the sun the bioluminescent plants dominated the grove, lighting the way for whatever nocturnal creatures thrived there. Two days had passed, he couldn't imagine how Naruto felt, having to endure all that strain with no rest. He had newfound respect for Naruto and his determination. The blonde finally collapsed out of exhaustion but surprisingly was still conscious. Any normal person would have passed out a hundred times over by now. He was in pretty rough shape, looking him over, there were more burned areas than not but luckily they didn't burn down into the muscles or fat. With some healing ointment he'd be good as new in no time. Akai Shi tried to move but his scales had grown too large and were overlapping preventing movement. He needed to call in Mundana for the boy and the brothers for himself. He took a moment and did just that. The sounds of the forest above stopped as his message was heard throughout the dragon's domain. A moment later, Mundana entered the grove, the plants illuminating his shadowy figure. 
You called my liege? Yes, I need you to take the boy and his familiar. Be sure to see to his wounds and send them off with extra healing ointment. Of course. Mundana approached Naruto's prone form, he had really gone overboard with the training. Mundana prepared to grab him by his tattered clothes and carry him that way. Like a cat carrying its young. Just as he bit down onto his shirt Naruto said, I can. Stand. Do you have the strength? Mundana asked. Naruto began to struggle to his feet, but then he paused and let out a small laugh. Can I lean on you Mundana? Certainly. Naruto grabbed hold of Mundana and hauled himself up little by little. He got onto his feet and then called out to Seiteki. Seiteki looked up sleepily from his resting rock. Truly, he had found the best rock to sleep on and now he had to leave. He let out a small whimper and gave it a longing snuggle before flying over to Naruto. His hood had been burned off so Seiteki chose to sit upon Mundana's head instead. Mundana began to escort the two of them out of the grove and towards their healer, Sukuru. They went slowly but Naruto was stumbling along, grunting in pain as they went. As they passed Akai Shi Naruto suddenly stopped walking. He looked upwards to the Dragon King, some of his face having been singed. I'll be back, soon, he said with a confident smirk. I eagerly await your return Naruto-san, they continued on out of the cave to get Naruto's treatment. Jakuna and Chishiki entered the grove and were surprised to see what looked like an iceberg sitting by the entrance, they stared at it in confusion. Ah, you've finally arrived. The iceberg spoke. Jakuna and Chishiki looked at each other dumbfounded. What does this piece of ice want with us brother? Jakuna asked. I am unsure, Chishiki responded. You mean to say you don't recognize the voice of your king? Akai Shi roared. Realization dawned upon Chishiki as he said, Oh of course we do, we were simply distracted by your form. Well it doesn't matter in any case, I need the two of you to help me to my lava pit in order to melt my scales. Aki Shi stated. As he spoke, a light bulb went off in Jakuna's head and he adopted a devious grin. He turned to his brother and began to whisper to him. Chishiki chuckled a bit but then shot him a look. Surely you are not serious? Chishiki asked. Jakuna nodded enthusiastically and Chishiki started to look nervous, but also a little excited. It wasn't often he and Jakuna caused mischief together. Jakuna started speaking to the iceberg, trying to restrain his laughter. I just remembered. We have a meatloaf in the oven. We need to go check on it. As soon as he said that, the two started walking off. What? Meatloaf. You don't even have opposable thumbs. You can't cook. Get back here. I command it. Chishiki and Jakuna continued to walk out of the grove, of course they planned to come back and help him later but they thought his reaction would be hilarious. As they were getting further and further away Akai Shi shouted one last thing. You don't have an oven. Naruto had finally made it to the healer's hut. Every step he took, every little movement he made caused him pain. As they entered the hut Naruto noticed many jars laying about. Some were up on shelves and others were stacked on top of each other. Seteki hopped off his horsey aka Mundana and began to wander around the hut, recoiling at the scent of some of the jars. Sukuru. This boy is in need of burn ointment. Understood. A silky smooth voice rang out. A female dragon? That's a first, Naruto thought. He was excited to see what she looked like, though judging from the size of the hut, she must be Mundana's size or smaller. Suddenly Naruto was drenched in a slightly viscous liquid. It covered him head to toe but he didn't complain at all. The moment this stuff made contact, the pain was greatly numb. Wow. What's in this stuff? Naruto wondered aloud. No don't, Mundana started but Sukuru cut him off. It's for instant pain relief, there are some herbs and other healing items mixed with my saliva and some mucus, though the effects don't last for long. Naruto laughed. They only just met and Sukuru was already telling jokes. Then he noticed how silent the hut was and his laughter stopped. W why aren't you laughing? Should I be? Sukuru asked. Naruto began to gag. Hey! If you puke in here, you're cleaning it up with your bare hands. Naruto got himself under control and turned to Mundana. She's crazy, he whispered, only a little, she's still a great healer. At last Sukuru revealed herself, a long slender dragon who looked more similar to a snake, though still with her four limbs. She had wings but didn't seem to need them, as she glided throughout the hut with ease. She placed down two jars in front of Naruto. 
You will apply this ointment to all affected areas every night for four consecutive days. Understood? What happens if I miss a day? Naruto asked. You turn into a slug. And with that she retreated back into her hut. Is she? Was she serious? I have no earthly idea. Best not to miss a day. Mundana answered. Naruto nodded fearfully. He called Seteki over to him and prepared to go back. Jiraiya must be waiting for him. Jiraiya was sitting in front of the campfire. He was trying to understand what made that girl so tough. If the Anbu's failure meant anything, it was that traditional methods won't work. The day Naruto left for the throat of the world, Jiraiya paid the redhead a visit. He didn't hurt her, only made veiled threats. He also implied that he suspected Naruto and her had been talking. He figured this would make Tuyuya pull away from Naruto. After that, hopefully she'll be more distraught and vulnerable. She'd be completely alone and he could get to work on dragging the information out of her. Jiraiya sighed and scratched his head. He didn't like to pull people's puppet strings like this but it was the mission. Having to rely on the void Naruto leaves behind didn't sit right with him either, but it was the best plan he had at the moment. Jiraiya turned as he heard a poof. Naruto appeared out of the smoke and collapsed shortly after. Jiraiya rushed to his side and saw all his burns. Naruto. What happened to you? I think. I went a little overboard. My everything hurts. Here, let me help. Jiraiya knelt down and started performing what little medical ninjutsu he knew. As his glowing hands traced over the burns, he noticed with great concern that nothing was happening. Naruto. Hum. Naruto said sleepily. What did this to you? Jiraiya asked, dumbfounded. Dragon chakra. Jiraiya stared at his student, surprised at how dangerous the dragons were, even to their own summoners. He scoffed. There's no way we'll be able to hit the road tomorrow. Not with you like this. What? I thought you said this was time sensitive. Naruto asked. It is. Then I can do it. Who knew being stubborn was her to Terry? Jiraiya sighed. All right fine, if we keep pace, we should be getting to our destination at about midday tomorrow, so be ready to pack up. Okay. Naruto said sleepily. I don't think I can move though. Jiraiya laughed heartily and decided to carry Naruto back into his tent so he could pass out in peace. The Toad Sage was hoping his plan for tomorrow would prove fruitful and he entered his tent for the night. It was the middle of the night, and Naruto awoke in a panic, and in pain. He had a nightmare that he turned into a slug, and the pain he felt all over alerted him to the, the fact that he had forgotten to apply his ointment. He opened the tent flap to let the chilled night air in. Every motion he made was painful and he started to tear up a bit. He opened one of the jars and began to apply the fluid, making sure not to wonder what it was made of this time. Tiyuya awoke to a strange sound coming from Naruto's tent. As she listened closer she could hear a groan, or a moan. She furrowed her brow and put her ear to the side of her tent. There was some kind of wet slapping sound every so often, always followed by a groan or sharp intake of air. She blushed furiously. No way. She quietly exited her tent and crawled to the side of Naruto's. She could hear the sounds more clearly now. So I'm not crazy. I wonder what he's thinking about while. She shook the thoughts out of her head. I should go back. As she started to return to her tent she noticed that Naruto's tent flap was open, wide open. No way. Maybe he's one of those people that wants to get caught, kinky. She tried to resist the urge to peek inside but curiosity is a powerful thing. Just a quick peek. She crawled over to the opening, blushing more and more as she got closer. As she poked her head into the tent ever so slightly, she covered her eyes, giving herself one last chance to back away lest she be scarred for life. She brought her hands down and her pervy smile was erased as she looked inside. Naruto. She muttered. He looked up, surprised that she was still awake in the dead of night. She crawled into the tent to get a closer look at him. He was clad in only his boxers but she barely noticed that. He was covered in surface level burns from head to toe, and he was rubbing whatever was in that jar onto himself. What the hell happened to you? She asked. I just went a little overboard while training training. You look half dead, and what the fuck are you rubbing on yourself? This. It's just burn ointment. But I've been here for like an hour and barely made any progress. If I move too fast or if my skin touches anything I freeze up in pain. Not to mention that this stuff stings. She could see that one of his arms was burnt all over. 
Without thinking she gently grabbed it and held it up closer. Suddenly Naruto grabbed her arm with his other hand. He was squeezing it so hard it hurt. Tuyuya looked up to see Naruto's face twisted in pain, and she realized her mistake. Sorry. Naruto stayed silent and just kept squeezing her arm. With her free arm Tuyuya reached over and grabbed the jar. She reached into it and covered her hand in the slick liquid. She slowly and gently began to apply it to his arm, hoping he would lessen his grip. The more she applied, the more Naruto loosened his grip. It seemed whatever this stuff was, it had some numbing properties. Naruto let go as she finished applying the ointment to his arm. He was about to apologize for grabbing her like that, but got distracted when he noticed her staring into the jar. She had a serious expression like she was considering the consequences of touching this stuff. Or something else. Evidently she thought this was more important as she dunked her hands into the jar once more. She continued her treatment and started to rub it on his chest. Her hands began to glide across his torso. He could feel how soft they were. Soft enough that he no longer felt the liquid sting and secretly, he was loving it. No wonder Seteki loves it when she pets him. As she finished treating his torso she moved up to his neck. She took a closer look and saw that even the underside of his chin was affected, so she needed better access. Lift your head up, she said while gathering more ointment. Naruto hesitated. Exposing your neck to an enemy shinobi was a quick way to get killed, and at the end of the day, she was still technically an enemy. But Naruto being Naruto, felt like he should give her the benefit of the doubt. He lifted his head and she began to apply the ointment with both hands. Naruto tensed up a bit thinking of how many ways she could probably kill him. But, just like his arm and chest, she finished quickly and moved on. Naruto relaxed, he dropped his guard and Tuyuya noticed that. She felt his body relax under her hands. She glanced at his face to see that his eyes were closed. So, he. Trusts me? Tuyuya couldn't help but smile slightly. Jiraiya might decide to kill her in the next few days, but it was nice to finally have a friend. Maybe friend is too strong a word, she thought. Then she remembered what Naruto said in her tent. Partner in crime. She thought with a smile. It didn't take long for her to finish treating his wounds, and as she gave him a last look over, she noticed that the burns looked better already. Thanks to Yuya. I feel a lot better. She gave him a silent nod and a small smile, then began to exit the tent. The least I can do for my partner in crime, she mumbled to herself. She exited the tent leaving behind Naruto with a big grin, he'd heard what she said. As Tuyuya returned to her tent she glanced at her hands in thought, she began to blush. He was basically naked. They were finally back on the road, heading towards the town, its hazy outline visible in the distance. Naruto had awoken that day to find that his burns had almost healed completely, and he was grateful for that because now he wouldn't be so much a burden. But even though they were nearing their destination there was something else on Naruto's mind. Tuyuya had been acting strangely around Jiraiya. Every time he got into close proximity she would flinch, sometimes even going so far as to step behind Naruto for cover. He couldn't understand what was wrong and he also couldn't ask since Jiraiya was right there. He would just have to let it go. Maybe she'll get over it, he thought. Naruto and company were standing just outside of town, they had arrived a bit past midday as Jiraiya predicted. They could already hear the large groups of people cheering from inside the buildings. All right, now that we're here, I need to gather some information and I can't do that if I have to watch her, Jiraiya said. You think you can handle keeping an eye on her Naruto? He nodded. Good. I need you to look around for me, here take this. Jiraiya handed Naruto a large coin purse. You'll be going casino hopping, you remember who we're looking for right? Yeah. A blonde lady with a temper and big boobs, right? No. Jiraiya reprimanded. Her boobs aren't just big, they're humongous, he shouted. Pervert. Naruto and Tuyuya mumbled simultaneously. They shared a passing glance and smirked. Jiraiya pretended not to hear them. Anyway, we'll be staying at the gambler's retreat motel, so meet me there at sunset. Hey, pervy sage, what about her? He said, pointing to Tuyuya. What do you mean? Jiraiya asked. Well if you won't be near us then the seal you put on her will start releasing the poison right? Oh, she'll be fine. Worst case scenario she'll feel a little sick, a headache, dizziness, and fatigue. Nothing serious. There was a moment of silence before Jiraiya spoke up again. If that's all I'll be on my way, and Naruto. 
don't lose all of the money. He then vanished into smoke. Naruto held up the coin purse, feeling the weight in his hand. He turned to Tiyuya with a grin. You ready to go gambling? Tiyuya and her chaperone, aka Naruto, were walking through the busy street, looking for a casino. Of course there were plenty of those around but Naruto was babbling on about how the casino needed to speak to him, so they kept walking. She didn't really care where they went, she was just following Naruto around, not like she had much a choice in the matter. He seemed excited though and Naruto's mood was often contagious. She had a weird feeling welling up in her chest, which made sense, this would be her first time gambling. But it was all so strange, she was a prisoner which was evident from the seal Jiraiya placed on her, but Naruto treated her so normally that it was hard to remember. This one. We're gonna be rich, I can feel it. Naruto's voice roused her from her thoughts. She looked up to see a fancy looking casino with bright lights and promises of grand prizes. People flowed endlessly in and out of the casino doors, some with smiles and extra cash and others who hung their heads, carrying out what coins they had left. Naruto began to walk through the front doors proudly and as he stepped inside, the smell of tobacco and alcohol washed over him. There were slot machines as far as the eye could see and tables where dealers waited patiently to try and crush their customers. He turned to Tiyuya and asked, what should we do first? Tiyuya had seen people gamble before so she had some idea of how it worked, but she was nearly clueless. She shrugged her shoulders. I've never gambled before. She said. Oh really? Me neither. He responded nonchalantly. She looked at him incredulously. You said we were gonna be rich but you don't even know how to gamble. What the hell is wrong with you? Naruto scratched the back of his head sheepishly and smiled. We'll figure it out, he declared confidently. He began to push through the crowds, periodically looking back to check that Tiyuya was still following close behind. She wondered if he was looking back to make sure she wouldn't get lost or if he was worried she'd try to escape. Naruto sat down at a slot machine whose bright colors caught his eye, he stared at it for a moment and then cocked his head to the side like a curious puppy. There was a small slit for money to be put in and a lever protruding out from the machine. Naruto slowly entered a coin into the machine and pulled the lever. The symbols started to spin rapidly and before he knew it they stopped. Suddenly, money came pouring out of the machine, much more than what he'd put in. He smiled broadly at Tuyuya who was staring in shock. This is easy. Why don't people do this every day? He exclaimed laughing. After the money stopped pouring out Naruto eagerly entered another coin and pulled the lever. The symbols spun once again and the pair watched intently. Once again money began to spew out, although much less than before. Woo. Naruto cheered, he was laughing heartily and happily. Tiyuya was also harboring a small smile, Naruto's mood was getting more and more infectious. He was beginning to catch people's attention. Let me try, Tiyuya said with hidden excitement. Sure. Naruto said while handing her a coin. Tiyuya sat down at the machine one over from him and entered the coin, she slowly placed her hand on the lever and hesitantly pulled it. The symbols spun and stopped one by one. 777 The machine blared with strange music and money burst forth in magnificent quantities. She stared at the river of money with delighted surprise, and Naruto stared too, but with a slightly different emotion. It's still going? He said with a little jealousy. Tiyuya began to run her hands through the piles of coins, she had never seen so much money. It was another 10 seconds before the flow finally ceased, and as it did Naruto locked eyes with her. There was a competitive fire burning in those cerulean blues and Tiyuya could tell she was going to have fun, for the first time in a while. Naruto grabbed one of the bags hanging from the side of the machine. It was a large sturdy sack that was meant to hold a slot player's winnings. He began to fill up his bag and Tiyuya did the same. Okay. Let's have a competition. Naruto proclaimed, while holding out his bag. What kind of competition? Tiyuya asked with restrained interest. We're gonna stay here for two hours and after time is up we count the money we made. Whoever has the most money at the end wins. She gave him a sly grin. Are you kidding? I'm definitely going to win. She pointed to a spot on the machine where the word, jackpot, was flashing red. I already hit the jackpot. There's no way you can catch up. Naruto maintained eye contact with her as he slid a coin into a random machine. He proceeded to pull the lever and confidently said, watch me. The machine spun, but this time it stopped and nothing happened. Naruto looked at the machine with an annoyed expression which caused Tiyuya to stifle a laugh. 
he blushed slightly in embarrassment. I'm still gonna win, he declared. Fine, she said. But don't cry when you lose. Right. Naruto answers sarcastically. Having issued the challenge Naruto goes off to find something more interesting than slot machines, of course Tiyuya follows, partly because she's still technically his prisoner, and partly because she wanted to win. A large wheel happened to catch his eye, next to it, there was a display case. Inside of the case were the finest silk robes Naruto had ever seen. They were black robes with gold accents and embroidery, just the look of these clothes made one long for its silky smooth embrace. Naruto and Tiyuya stepped closer to the wheel with curiosity and as they did so, a man came forward to greet them. Hello and welcome to the Wheel of Fortune. Would the lovely couple like to take a spin? Yes. Naruto shouted absent-mindedly. Tiyuya shot him a confused and surprised look. Couple? She thought slightly embarrassed. Naruto walked up to the wheel and paused. So I just spin it? Well yes, but first you must pay the small fee. It's a measly 10,000 ryo, surely a small price for someone like you. Naruto beamed and Tiyuya deadpanned. He's falling for that guy's act hook, line, and sinker, she thought. Here ya go. Naruto said as he paid the fee. Naruto grinned and turned to the wheel, grabbed it and spun the wheel with all his might. He stepped back to watch as it went around and around, wondering if this would help him win their competition. The wheel spun and spun and kept on spinning. It seemed Naruto had really put his back into it. As the rotation finally began to slow, Tuyuya was able to see some of the rewards, the highest number she could see was 100,000 and then there was the jackpot which she assumed was the silk robes. She smirked knowing that even if Naruto got the 100,000 ryo she would still be in the lead, as the slot machine had dished out a 500,000 reward. The wheel slowed further and further, every time she thought it would stop it pushed on. At last, it slowly pushed past the 5,000 Rio reward and into the jackpot. And we have a winner. You are now the proud owner of these gorgeous robes. You would look quite dashing in these robes if I do say so myself. But, if they're not your style it's a perfect gift for your woman. Something tantalizing for her to wear before you take her to bed if you know what I mean. He wiggled his eyebrows suggestively while handing Naruto the robes. Tayuya giggled as she noticed Naruto's expression and decided to pay him back for calling them a couple. She wrapped her arms around him from behind and whispered to him. Well? Do you want me to wear that tonight? Naruto blushed, but quickly took the robes and threw them over Tayuya's face before walking away. Tayuya put the robes on and chased after him laughing. So you don't want to spin again? The man yelled after them. Naruto stopped in front of a table that was surrounded by a decent crowd of people. He stared at it wondering how the game worked. There seemed to be a wheel embedded in the table, it had black and red numbers that were also shown on the table itself. Tiyuya stood beside him and they watched as people placed chips on the table, after they were done, a man at the end of the table spun the wheel and placed a marble inside. The marble spun around and around until finally landing on a red 3. They watched as people who had chips on red cheered and the people who had chips on 3 or near it cheered louder. Naruto wanted to play. But Tiyuya needed more information, she still wasn't sure how it worked. She approached a man who didn't seem to be betting and tapped him on the shoulder getting his attention. Meanwhile Naruto went up to the man at the wheel to ask if he could join. Can you tell me how this game works? Tiyuya asked the man. Um sure. Nothing like getting a random stranger to deliver exposition. Anyway, the game is called roulette. It's more or less based completely on luck. In order to play, you have to place your chips onto the table, signifying what you want to bet on. The man explained. You can place your chips onto a number, row of numbers, or column of numbers. Basically, if the ball in the wheel lands on anything you bet on, you win. You can also bet on a color, red or black, so if the ball lands on red and you bet red. I win. To you you said, following along with the rules. That's about it. You want a tip? To you you leaned in excited to get an edge and blow Naruto out of the water. Always bet on black, the man said with a sly smile. Just then Naruto approached her. That guy said we can't play unless we get chips from the lady over there. You coming? Yeah. I got a good feeling about this game, Tiyuya said. As they walked away the stranger started muttering to himself. Man. All that talking got me thirsty. Cage should have just made you guys google the rules. It would have been way easier than typing all this. They went to the counter and got their chips. 
Of Naruto's 240,000 ryo, he converted 100,000 into chips. And of Tuyuya's 500,000 ryo, she converted 250,000 into chips. They went back to the roulette table and began to play. Tuyuya was considering what the man said and figured that she should take the advice of a more experienced gambler. She set aside 40,000 in chips and prepared to put it on black, but stopped as she saw Naruto shove all 100,000 of his chips onto red. He looked her in the eye and smiled wide. That son of a bitch. He's challenging me. He thinks I'm too pussy to bet it all. Well news flash. My balls are huge. She pushed all her chips onto black and grinned right back at him. After all the bets were locked in, the wheel was spun and the ball dropped into it. That little marble went around and around, jumping in and out of the slots, until it finally stopped. On 36 red. Tuyuya looked like her soul was crushed along with her hopes and dreams. Naruto looked around as everyone else was cheering, but was surprised when someone slapped a hand on his shoulder. I can't believe you called it right you crazy bastard, the man said laughing. Naruto blinked. Oh I won. W O O O O. He shot out of his seat to celebrate. H he. He doesn't even know the rules. Her head shot up and snapped to the side as she made eye contact with the man who explained the rules to her. He quickly averted his gaze, started whistling, then began to slowly back away from the table and the malicious redhead. Hey to Yuya. Naruto's voice broke her out of her murderous thoughts. Where did all your chips go? He gloated. And just like that, the murderous thoughts resumed. But seriously that was a lot of money to lose. We can stop competing if you want. Oh that's convenient. Stop the competition while you're ahead, in your dreams, she exclaimed. He waited for her to return as she got more chips, having exchanged another 100,000 ryo. Should we keep playing roulette? Naruto asked. No this one's rigged. Tuyuya said pouting, as if she was talking about some game at a festival. Naruto chuckled and led the way to a new table. This one had seven people sitting with cards in their hands. Naruto approached someone who was standing nearby. What game is this? He asked. This one's called poker. You play it by. Ah. My head hurts already, this is too complicated. Thanks though, Naruto said while walking away. Tuyuya followed. But, that other guy got his time in the spotlight, the stranger mumbled. Even the wheel of fortune dude got more dialogue, don't leave. The man hung his head as he realized the two shinobi didn't even look back. Oh. I know this one. Naruto exclaimed. I thought you said you never gambled before. Tuyuya asked. I haven't. But I remember playing this with, he trailed off and glanced at her. With who? My grandfather. He taught me this in solitaire. Tuyuya glanced over the many tables set up for this game. From what she could see, the dealer lost more often than not. It could be a good way to regain the lead. How do you play? She asked. In blackjack you just need to beat the dealer's hand by getting as close to 21 as possible but without going over. To do that you can either, hit, and take another card or, stand, to not. See the numbers on my cards just have to be higher than the dealer's? Tuyuya asked. Naruto nodded. What about the king and the other ones? The royals all count as 10 and an ace can count as 1 or 11, whatever helps your hand. There's a couple other things, but you'll pick it up as we go. A group of people got up from one of the blackjack tables, leaving it empty except for the woman on the other side, the dealer. Tuyuya decided to sit at that table. There was writing on it that read, dealer must stand at all seventeens. The dealer decided to make conversation as they settled in. I see you've won big in the wheel of fortune, you're quite a lucky lady. Well, actually he won. I just took the robes. Tuyuya laughed. The dealer leaned in close so that Naruto wouldn't hear. He's rather handsome. It looks like you hit the jackpot either way. Are we starting soon? Naruto cut in. The dealer cleared her throat. Sorry about that sir, we'll begin right away. Please place your bets. Naruto decided to bet 50,000 chips and Tuyuya did the same. The dealer began handing out cards so that everyone had two, though one of the dealer's cards was face down. Tuyuya was given an 8 and a 2, the dealer's face up card was a 5 and Naruto had a king and an ace. Well look who's on a lucky streak tonight, the dealer said to Naruto. She turned to Tuyuya to see what she would do. Tuyuya decided she should take another card. Hit me. The dealer handed her another card, a 9. With her total now at 19, she decided that taking another card was too risky. 
so now it was the dealer's turn to play her hand. She flipped up her second card and revealed it to be a 7. She took another card, a 5, making her total 17. Ah, you guys got me. The dealer exclaimed. She dished out the rewards and cleared the table. Who's ready for another round? Excuse us. A deep voice called out. Two men approached the table. They were wearing suits and looked like they were part of the security staff. We're gonna need both of you to come with us. What? Why? Naruto asked. We just want to ask you a couple questions that's all, his partner said. Tuyuya glanced around for a moment. She could see more men in suits all around them. Some were circling like vultures while others blocked the exits. If all you want to do is ask questions, I can answer them from right here, Tuyuya stated. The man with the deep voice spoke up again, this time with some attitude. The two of you have been awfully lucky tonight, don't you think? Because I'll let you know what I think. He stepped closer for dramatic effect. I think you're a couple of no good cheating thieves. We already caught your blonde headed partner, so just come with us and don't make a scene. Tuyuya didn't really see a way out of this, but considering they haven't been cheating, it shouldn't be a problem to just go with them. It was really annoying her though, she was actually having fun for once. They both stood up from the table and then suddenly. Whack. Naruto had taken the tray that held his chips and slammed it into the poor man's face. He turned to Tuyuya. Run. Naruto took off, pushing the other security guard to the floor. Before Tuyuya could even register what happened, two more guards came at her. Well I can't get caught now. She took a page out of Naruto's book and threw her chips at the first guard. Then she took her bag of Ryo and smacked the second across the face with it. The bag tore open and coins flew about the casino. People got out of their seats and threw themselves to the ground, trying to collect the fallen coin. The casino descended into chaos, but Tuyuya didn't pause for a second. She ran past the two guards, trying to catch up to Naruto who hadn't stopped sprinting. From her position she could see a guard coming from Naruto's right side, about to intercept him. Naruto look out, she shouted. Naruto saw the guard coming and as he got closer Naruto dropped down to the ground causing the guard to trip over him and get a mouthful of dirty carpet. Tuyuya ran past Naruto giggling uncontrollably. He was still on the ground, surprised his idea worked that well. Get up faster, we gotta go, she yelled through the laughter. Naruto got up to his feet and dodged another guard before continuing his grand escape. The two were now nearing the entrance, with Tuyuya in front. Her plan was simply to run out the front doors but what she saw stopped her dead in her tracks. In front of the door stood the largest man she'd ever seen. He had to be at least six foot, but he wasn't just tall, he was wide. This giant boulder of a man came rushing toward her, moving at a speed that should be impossible for someone that size. Tuyuya was about to turn around, run back into the casino in the chaos. Duck. Naruto's voice called out to her. She dropped to the ground as Naruto came flying overhead. He planted both feet into the guard's chest, sending them both tumbling down to the ground. Tuyuya quickly grabbed Naruto's arm and pulled him up. They made a break for the exit and Naruto shouted out. Sorry Humpty Dumpty. You were in the way. Then he started laughing maniacally. They pushed the doors open and made it to freedom, or so they thought. As they looked back to see if guards were pouring out of the casino, they saw a lone man exit calmly. His suit was different from the others, more distinct. He was probably the head of security. They saw him, and he saw them. They started to run through the streets, trying to lose him. But every time they looked back, there he was, hot on their trail. This guy is fast. He's gotta be an ex-shinobi or something, Naruto thought. They were running out of options, but when Naruto thought all hope was lost, Tuyuya called out to him. Naruto. Over here. I know how to shake him. She darted into an alleyway and Naruto followed. They ran side by side through the alley until it split two ways. Naruto began to run to the right but Tuyuya grabbed a hold of his shirt and pulled him to the left. They ran for a bit and then Tuyuya stopped behind a certain building, climbing up and over obstacles until she could reach the roof. Naruto opted to just walk up the wall. Well rub it in my face why don't ya? She grumbled. She quickly opened a door and pulled Naruto inside, shutting it behind them. As Naruto entered, he could see that this little room on the roof was used for storage. He didn't have time to continue searching however, as suddenly they could hear footsteps on the roof, they both froze. The footsteps went from one side of the building to the other. Like he was looking out onto the streets for them. 
After a second they heard the man speak. Damn. Those little bastards were fast. And with that the footsteps retreated back towards the casino. They both let out a sigh of relief, having shook the super guard off their trail. Tuyuya went to the door and slowly took a peek outside, while Naruto resumed his search. He looked inside a couple of boxes, but all he could find were different types of instruments. They were mostly instruments that had fallen out of fashion, or were just too old. What is this place? Naruto wondered aloud. There's an instrument shop below us. They never lock the door up here. You've been here before? Naruto asked. There was a sudden tension in the room, Naruto wasn't sure why. He decided that maybe it wasn't the best time for questions and changed the subject. I've always wanted to learn how to play an instrument, do you know how? I can play the flute, she answered, relieved at the quick diversion. Naruto began to rummage around in the boxes. He paused and then pulled something out of the box as Tuyuya shut the door again. He turned and showed it to her. Will you play something for me? He asked. Tuyuya stared at what was in his hands and laughed. That's a trumpet, she said. Yeah, what about it? A flute and a trumpet are nothing alike. You blow in both of them, Naruto pointed out. Okay yeah, but a flute is beautiful and elegant. A trumpet on the other hand. She grabbed the trumpet and blew into it, creating a terrible sound. A trumpet is a trumpet. Naruto chuckled and then he remembered something. Hey where's all the money you won? He asked. She pulled out the ruptured bag and a few coins fell out of it. It broke after I hit a guard with it. Naruto began laughing, so that means I win right? What? That's not fair. You're the one who started smacking people with chips. I only hit that guy to catch up to you. The rules were simple, whoever has the most money in the end wins. Naruto said smugly. Yeah well, I'm keeping these robes. Naruto snickered. In reality he didn't really want the robes, but he was glad Tuyuya got something out of this. Anyway let's hit another casino, I still have a job to do after all. Naruto said. He opened the door and walked to the back edge of the building. He started looking over the rooftops for another casino they could search. There was one not too far from where they were, he just hoped the first casino didn't alert the others in the area about them. Let's get going. Naruto said. Wait. I, just want to check something first. Tuyuya then dropped down to the front of the shop and Naruto followed. The shop had a large glass window that let you see all their instruments from outside. But there was one instrument set apart from the others. There was a flute sitting on a purple pillow on a pedestal. It was white and gold and looked masterfully crafted. Tuyuya stared at it through the window. It's still here, she muttered to herself. Damn. That's a nice flute. Naruto blurted out. It's not just a nice flute. It's the best fucking flute you'll ever see. She was obviously very passionate about this fucking flute. You know the old shop owner let me touch it once. Always wondered what it sounded like, she said without thinking. She backed away from the glass, forcing herself to tear her eyes away from the display. That's all I wanted. Let's go. Tuyuya started to walk away, but Naruto didn't follow immediately. She couldn't turn back to check because if she did, she knew she would go right back to staring at that flute. Naruto caught up to her soon enough though. As he walked beside her, he started talking. We've a couple more hours before we need to go meet Jiraiya at the motel. You haven't seen any blonde women with big boobs have you? No, she said amused. Suddenly her step faltered and she paused for a moment. Her head was starting to hurt, and she felt groggy. Naruto stopped as well. You okay? She nodded and waved a hand dismissively. As she did so, she took note of her new silky robes. She stared at the sleeve that covered part of her hand. You sure you're okay? Then she came to a realization. Do you remember what the guard said to us? When they tried to question us? She asked randomly. That we were no good dirty cheaters. No, when he said that they already got our blonde partner? Oh yeah. I remember now, you don't think he was talking about our target, do you? Well he didn't say big titty blonde but we got one part. Should we go back? Fuck no. She exclaimed. In that moment, she got the worst case of vertigo she's ever had. Her head started aching, like her brain wanted to hop out of her skull. Ah. This seal is no fucking joke, she moaned. Suddenly Tuyuya lost the strength in her legs and the world started spinning. She tried to get back up but had completely lost her balance. Naruto was saying something to her but she couldn't really understand him. 
Then her world went dark and she hit the hard ground. She awoke in some sort of lobby, and she couldn't feel her feet on the ground. As her vision cleared she could see that she was clinging onto Naruto's back. It seemed him and Jiraiya were talking. It was kinda hard to keep looking when your poison made me carry an unconscious girl through the streets. Okay. Fair point. But still, all you got was one lead? You didn't find her either, did you pervy sage? Not only that but I got here at sunset like you said. The moon is out. Alright. Alright. I'm sorry I'm late. Let's just get our rooms and rest up for tomorrow, okay? Naruto sighed and nodded. They approached the counter and Jiraiya began speaking to the attendant. I need a double for me and a single for the kid. Jiraiya handed her some money. No problem. The attendant said as she grabbed the room keys and handed them over. Jiraiya placed Naruto's key on the counter beside him. All right, hand her over to me. Jiraiya held his arms out, ready to carry her. Naruto was ready to hand her over but she whispered to him. He stopped in surprise, he didn't even know she woke up. No, don't let him take me, please. Naruto never heard her sound so distressed. Um, pervy sage? Huh. I don't mind taking the double and watching her. That way you can bring all your lady friends back here. Jiraiya stepped forward with a serious expression. Naruto, do you have any idea, how happy I am to hear that? There's a whole town of curvaceous, voluptuous women waiting out there. There's no one else in the world I'd rather call my student Naruto. He shoved the key into Naruto's hand and took the other, immediately taking off into the night to lay down his masterful charm. Naruto watched him retreat into the night before heading up to the stairs. Naruto got to the room and began to fiddle with the key. Put me down, I can walk. Tuyuya said sleepily. Naruto obliged. Feeling better? Naruto asked. She rubbed her eyes, just tired. He opened the door and they both walked inside. Naruto set down his belongings and Tuyuya sat on one of the beds. Can I ask you something? Tuyuya nodded. What happened while I was gone? Why do you act like pervy sage is gonna chop you up into little pieces? Tuyuya kept uncomfortably silent. Okay fine. What about the shop then? How did you know about it? Once again, silence. Naruto sucked his teeth and turned his back to her. He started searching through his belongings until he pulled out the jar he got from Sukuru. He sat upon the floor and began to undress before beginning to apply the ointment. Naruto hissed quietly at its sting. There was a moment of silence before he noticed Tuyuya come over, setting aside her new robes to make sure they didn't get dirty. Without a word, she reached into the jar and began applying it. Just like last night, her soft and supple hands took away that sting, and Naruto let her do the rest. Like the time before, she started with his arms, then his torso, neck, face, and finally his back. When she got behind him to treat his back she stopped. Naruto hadn't relaxed under her hands like before, in fact, he hadn't relaxed at all. She didn't want to push him away, he was the first thing to make her laugh in years. But if she told Naruto everything, all the things she was hiding from the Anbu, from Jiraiya, they wouldn't need her alive anymore. But if she gave them nothing they'd kill her anyway. There was a weight on her chest that she just couldn't lift. Every option she could think of resulted in death, or torture and then death. Except for one. If she could trust him, if he could help her, if for just this once, she could actually rely on somebody, then maybe. Although, she'd rather experience death than another betrayal. Jiraiya, Naruto perked up as she began to speak. When you left, he came to threaten me, to tell me that if I didn't give something up he would have the Anbu torture me non-stop. He said that. No but it's what he meant. He even said that he knew I've been with you, that I can't talk to you or else you'll be tortured too. Naruto stared off with a concerned look. That didn't sound anything like the perverted Jiraiya he knew. Why would he let them stay in the same room if he thought that? Liar. Naruto scoffed. What? She said quietly. You're lying to me, straight to my face. This is going so wrong. I am not. It won't work. I'm going to die. I know you're lying. Pervy Sage isn't like that. You keep making the same mistakes. Keep trusting people. Now you'll die for it. Naruto tried to get up from the floor, he was done with this, done with her. Tuyuya threw her arms around him, keeping him down. Please believe me. I need your help, but what else can you do? I'm too weak to fend for myself. You want me to believe you? How the hell am I supposed to do that? 
I'm one of the sound for Naruto. I know a lot about Orochimaru, don't you have any idea what they'll do for information on him? Please. I know everything. His plans, his experiments, his bases. Then something clicked in Naruto's head. Tell me how you knew about the shop, he said calmly. There's a base, outside of town. Her voice was breaking up and Naruto could feel tears falling from her face onto his body. Working for Orochimaru was miserable. It was even worse inside the bases, filled with crazies and twisted experiments. I got away as much as I could, that shop was the only place I felt, right, my only home. Naruto listened as she spoke. It sounded genuine and everything was starting to click into place. But, can Jiraiya really be that cruel? Please Naruto, I don't want to die. Naruto was silent for a while and Tuyuya's crying had stopped. He wasn't sure what to do, he didn't even know what he could do to help in the first place. I need to talk to Pervy Sage, but if what she said was true, I can't let him know about this, he thought. I'll try and help you Tuyuya. I promise. Naruto felt that she was hanging loosely off of him and turned his head to look at her face. She was asleep, having poured the rest of her energy into getting him to save her. As Naruto carried Tuyuya to the bed and went to lay in his own, a coin at the bottom of Jiraiya's coin pouch disappeared into smoke. Jiraiya rose from the bed slightly and his eyes widened as the memories of his clone came back to him. He crawled out from under his naked lady friends and entered the bathroom. He stood still, sorting through the memories. Then he opened his eyes. Shit, Jiraiya was taken aback at the girl's actions. He thought that she would have pulled away from Naruto but instead she confided in him. Their continued relationship was going to be really complicated. I need to talk with Naruto, Jiraiya thought. The end. We will see you in the next video.